OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Yes, a very good morning to you. It's half past seven and you're welcome along to Friday mornings, OTB AM, the sports breakfast show here on Off The Ball. We're live, as always, on our social media platforms, youtube.com forward slash Off The Ball. We're also live on Facebook and indeed on Twitter at Off The Ball and on the OTB Sports app as well. You can download that for free if you haven't already and you probably should have by this stage uh, in the App Store or the Play Store. Get in touch with us uh, throughout the show this morning. We're live right up until 10 a.m. this morning as usual. You can comment uh, on our YouTube stream or wherever you're watching this morning. And OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette. Good mornings. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It's the final OTB AM before the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Final between Cork and Limerick on Sunday afternoon. Yesterday, of course, our own Owen Sheehan came to you live from the Treaty County. We heard all from the uh, Limerick uh, fans in the build-up to that match this Sunday afternoon. This morning, though, it is the People's Republic of Cork's turn. So Owen is alive with us this morning from the Rebel County and indeed the banks of the River Lee. Good morning, Owen. I, I wish, unfortunately, I've had to, to run to cover a little bit. You're somewhere. Because, uh, it, is, uh, it is. Yes, I'm on McCurtain Street, not too far from the banks of the Lee, I can, I can assure you. Uh, it is, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a miserable morning in Cork. You can just about make out uh, the, the mountainous areas around it through the, the mist. And uh, I guess this is, this is where we are. You should bring a raincoat to, to Cork. And I didn't learn that lesson ever in my life. So uh, this is on me. But uh, yeah, I've been here now since yesterday afternoon. And we're going to be bringing you all the sights and sounds of uh, the people I met yesterday and, and, and what's happening around the county in the build-up to this final. It's been a long time, Shane, eight years without Cork in either senior final in, in men's uh, football and hurling. So uh, it, it's, bit, it's a bit different when Cork are there. Of course, everything is different with only 40,000 people there this weekend. But having Cork in a hurling final, I think, adds a whole other layer of glamour to it. Like, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your uh, your Limerick build-up yesterday morning and the the confidence slash cockiness from the Limerick camp, like Pa Buckley and his... Uh, his gear, he was he was ready. I think the first words in that uh, that clip were "up Limerick, no surrender." Uh, I, like I got a chill up my spine. Is is there a similar kind of confidence coming out of the Cork Cork fans in the, in the build up to this one? There is, as uh, no, it's not similar. There there is a confidence because um, they're from Cork and they always have this real sense of confidence. And I would say, why wouldn't you be confident if you've made it all the way to a hurling final? Because in modern hurling, to make it to the last two, you've got to be pretty good to make it that far. So I think anybody who makes it to an All-Ireland Hurling final deserves to have that level of confidence. And with Cork, it has increased a little bit. Now the thing, the expectations on this Cork team, I find anyway, this is purely anecdotal, is, are, are less than they would be were this week not also a massive underage week. I think, especially since they've already got the under-20s job done this week and they expect to get the minors job done on Saturday, I think that kind of lessens the burden of pressure on the senior team because A, they're not favourites and B, they know that the good times are coming and if it's not this year and if it's not next year, it's going to be pretty soon after. People are extremely positive about the direction that Cork Hurling is going at the moment. So there is a quiet confidence about this Sunday, but it is very much under the parameters of a free hit when it comes to how the supporters are looking at it. So like we're, we're literally a minor under twenty and senior travel. I think I don't think it's been done by Cork since what nineteen seventy. Can Kenny, I think, have done it a couple of times in the interim period. But like this is this the confidence in the Cork uh, amongst the Cork people can only be because this is the start of a Cork period of dominance. Like when you see those kids coming up, I mean this is this is scary stuff for everyone else. We know how dominant Limerick are, of course, at senior level. But like when you've got the the talent and strength and depth coming through the ranks like that from Cork, that's a scary thing for every other county. Absolutely. And we're going to hear from a member of the under 20s management a little bit later on in the show. And he was making the point that as uh, Limerick have done, they have really tapped into the, the school system in the city. And it seems to be that there is a, almost a blueprint for hurling success at the moment for, for any young bunch of hurlers. And it is if you get your schools right, that is the most important part of the foundation. And uh, Christian Brothers School in, in Cork City here, which would be known as more of a rugby school, certainly from from my standpoint and all the, the famous people that have come through those doors, uh, it, it, that seems to have changed a little bit. And that seems to have changed maybe more towards a hurling school. Uh, and I'm sure that there is still a, a, a heavy rugby imprint on things there. But uh, Cork GEA and people who are passionate about Cork GEA have started to look at that element of things differently. And it's almost like we were having the exact same conversation yesterday about how 
Limerick managed to become the dominant team in the country over the last few years. It is because of their school system, the investment in the youth and their extremely talented youngsters that they've come through from, from a huge population base. And Ger was making the point on yesterday's show that this is perhaps a preview of what these next five, ten years might actually look like when it comes to the, the dominant teams in hurling. I do think that maybe we overreact to an All-Ireland final pairing and we suddenly forget how great Kenny can be or Tipperary can be in Waterford and so on. And we just focus on these two teams and everybody else is kind of a case of out of sight or, or, and out of mind. But there is enough that we have seen from these two teams and the way that these two teams have arrived where you're like, yeah, this is sustainable and, and these two teams might be the two teams to catch over the next little while. Oh, that'd be great. Like if we if we get a proper rivalry going over the next few years. Like the thing I love about this week is, and the colour that, that you're bringing to us as well is, the, the feel of an All-Ireland final, a proper build-up within a county. Like we had, sadly as a Monaghan fan, I haven't experienced that feeling in the county of, of you know, the lead into an, to an All-Ireland, All-Ireland final. Like I wasn't wasn't quite alive back in 1930 when Monaghan got to an All-Ireland final. But like you as a Kerry fan in the football, you've experienced this. Like Dennis Bastic was on the um, the Saturday panel with John Duggan last week and he was talking about, you know, the build-up to the, the semi-final uh, for sure in Dublin. Not much bunting, not much flags, not much atmosphere, probably a little bit of familiarity with getting to fi- get semi-finals and finals whereas he had driven through Mayo and the atmosphere and the flags uh, were, were everywhere like have you noticed in Cork and Limerick there's absolutely little to, to be left in in terms of uh, wanting in terms of flags like is the atmosphere quite quite similar in both counties in the build-up it's a good question I would say that Limerick uh, on on an obvious level are way more vocal and uh, I guess when it comes to the, the evidence of the colour on the screen, it's way more obvious in that city that they're in an All-Ireland final. It's not necessarily overly obvious here. We've got a little bit of red bunting around me here, but really it's kind of on the north side of the city. And uh, when you go up that part that you start to see houses bedecked in, in red and white, whereas in Limerick it was every second house and every single small townland around that county seemed to be totally done up in green and white. Like, you're right what you say about Dublin, I think it's little pockets of Dublin. It's like a, a pub or a clubhouse that have a player and team that get completely kitted out for the All-Ireland final. But certainly, down in Kerry, you wouldn't really see flags until the All-Ireland final. And even then, it may not be what you'll see uh, in Mayo. It's definitely not what you would see in Mayo. But Limerick, for me, was the county that kind of blew me away a little bit on that regard. Now, I've never been in Mayo on All-Ireland final week, so I don't actually know what it's like. But Limerick, it was like, hold on a minute. This is, it almost feels as if this is still very much a novelty for them to be in an All-Ireland hurling final, even though they're the heavy favourites to win three out of four uh, on Sunday. Whereas in Cork, it's, it's a little bit more toned down, but that's just quite into the fact that it's a bigger city and it's it's not all hurling mad, whereas Limerick, it seems, uh, have been taken over uh, by the, the spirit of hurling and is now just one massive hurling county and nowhere you can go in that place. You can go nowhere without seeing green and white. So it's, it is an interesting uh, contrast but Limerick for me definitely right at the top of the table when it comes to showing off to everybody that you know what we're in the hurling final like I feel like we all get somewhat carried away by the underdog stories heading into to an All-Ireland final any year that there's an, an obvious underdog and it's it's probably a little bit harsher in Cork to say they're obvious underdogs but I think the bookies have the maybe uh, five point underdogs certainly heading into this one but there's a kind of a vibe that this core team you mentioned it yourself like no final since 2013 a little bit starved of success. Like, is there a vibe in Cork over the last day or so that you've been there that that there may be, quote, due an All Ireland? And I know no county really wins an All Ireland just because they're due one, but there certainly has to be that feeling, Cork, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, uh, like not not necessarily being due one. I think the confidence is actually coming from the performance against Kilkenny. I think that maybe if you were asking Cork people what your confidence levels were like before that semi final compared to now, obviously you've won the semi-finals so everybody's going to be more confident, but I think it, it is actually unusual just how much more confident they are as a result of the manner of that win in the semi-final, because Cork have been levelled with a lot of serious accusations over the course of those eight years. A lot of them were well-founded, but I'm sure they were all deeply insulting to people who were involved in the camps. Questions of their character, questions of whether or not they had stomach for the battle, questions of whether or not they were, they were hard enough to actually sustain a run in modern hurling. That is a serious list of allegations of a modern hurling team. And I'm sure there was dressing room on the wall stuff. And I'm sure as well, it might have crept into a few Cork fans' heads 
once Kilkenny scored that last second goal in the All-Ireland semi-final, I'm sure people were thinking, here we go again. This is Cork over the last eight years. But Cork said, not today. This is different. We are a different team. We are not putting up with all this nonsense that's been spouted about us over the best part of the last decade. We are going to prevail in these tough circumstances. And I think it is that manner of victory in the semi-final which has Cork people so confident, even more confident than they ordinarily would be, that they can cause a big upset. Also, we've seen so many times in the past that teams just peak at the perfect time when it comes to an All-Ireland final. Cork, you can definitely say that about, that they are peaking at just the right time. And certainly when it comes to the curve in their season, they're probably going to hit peak performance on Sunday. The problem is Limerick don't do peaking. Limerick just show up, well, except for first halves against Tipperary, for example. But by and large, they don't do peaking. They just show up and, and they put in an 8 or 9 out of 10 performance every single time they go out. And you fear that unless they drop below a, a 7.5 or an 8 on Sunday, they won't get beaten. So, so that is the problem. It is an immovable object that Cork are coming up against. But it doesn't mean that the way that it's been playing this year can't give their fans serious hope that an upset can happen. Yeah, absolutely. It's gonna it's set up so so nicely to be a cracker. I think, and like a lot of people are calling it to be quite tight. Like a draw has been mooted by quite uh, some amount of pundits in the build up as well. So I, I really can't wait for it. So loads of really good stuff to come from Owen this morning, uh, in terms of build up from from down in Cork. So if you're a Limerick fan yesterday, you'll have enjoyed all the build up. Uh, this morning, though, the Limerick fans will have to sit back, relax, kind of enjoy what, what uh, Owen's about to bring you from uh, the Rebel County this morning. It'll get a bit of fire in the belly, I think, ahead of Sunday. For Cork fans, you're just going to enjoy it and love this uh, this morning. And for the neutrals, it'll give us an insight into what it's like in a county in the build of the All Ireland final and uh, set the scene a little bit, a bit of atmosphere. But I think, Owen, uh, first of all, uh, you were out and about and managed to catch up with uh, some Cork hurling fans over the past 24 hours. So let's have a look. OCB. Hi, uh, my own name is uh, Saul Kavanagh. I'm uh, Douglas, would have been my GA club all my life. I've played for Douglas for about 30 years. And, uh, well, basically, when they kind of more or less retired from playing, I started supporting Cork. And my first time in Crow Park was 1973, and I forget it, Cork were in the semi final against Tyrone. That was my first match there. Uh, Billy Field, Cork free taker, actually broke the leg the same day. And lucky enough, Cork went on to win it, and as you know, later went on to win the final. You're a hurling and a football man. Oh, definitely, I'd be equal to. But if I had a preference, it would have to be the the command. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're we're fairly confident going into Sunday on um, the like the wins over Clare, Kilkenny, Dublin. Like the confidence we've been building every match, and I think the extra time victory. Really, really gave the players a bit of confidence, and uh, I think what's most important about Sunday now is, um, like, there's a generation of Cork fans there that um, that they haven't, they've been starved of seeing of seeing success. They like uh, Cork have won in All Ireland since 2005, and there's a full generation of Cork fans in their late teens and early twenties, and they, they've heard about the folklore about like the Rock. Ben O'Connor, uh, Dino, all these players, but they need new heroes now. And you're going to have the likes of Jack O'Connor, Hoggy, uh, Rob Downey, Tim O'Mahony, all of them, Darf is given. They're all going to come to the four now, Sunday, I think Sunday, and I think Cork are going to do it on. So first question Why the blue jersey? <laughs> <laughs> there was no other ones in Sports Direct. They were all sold out, Owen. So there's huge demand behind it already, as you can see, you know. So there's massive momentum behind Cork Hurling. So that's the answer to your first question. And, and did you get instant recognition for it when, when you started wearing the sombrero and all that? Well, I'd say I'd have to claim to be one of the first ever to introduce the sombrero. Like, as you see now, every county have a kind of a sombrero man as well. Like, but uh, I think I go back to the original species. Like, <laughs> do, you, do you get uh, a, a little bit kind of um, territorial when you see other people in sombreros at games supporting other counties? I know, so that's the way it's gone at the moment. You know, the, you can see the colour at the moment, the bunting flags, it's, it's gone over this. Proportional to get an old lately, like you know, but I stick to me all old routine and it's so well recognised. Well, the forecast is supposed to be for rain on, so I suppose that won't really suit Cork. But if it says some bit dry, I suppose Cork will try try work the ball into space and, and get the likes of Jack O'Connor uh, running onto the ball in space and and Robbie O'Flynn. And if they can, and if if, if those uh, pacey Cork forwards can get running at the Limerick back, hopefully Cork can get goals and uh, goals could win it for Cork one. Hopefully, please God. If you had to pick a number between one and three for how many of the titles they're going to win this week, obviously it's one at least. So what, what are you going to go for? Absolutely three, Owen. Um, but it's absolutely fantastic. 
you know, to see the momentum around the place and, and, and the spirit behind Cork Hurling. And as you come into Cork, you know, you can see a sea of red and that'll only be building, you know. So, um, as I said earlier, Mr. Owen Sheen, it's great to have you in Cork City, the rebel county and the real capital. And there's been a new recruit to, to your sombrero army. Oh, there's a, a new recruit, Ben Cyril O'Driscoll. Well, we may as well introduce the world to, to, to Ben Cyril O'Driscoll. Come on, Ben. Ben, I can get the whole idea. Good boy. Good boy, Ben. Oh, man. It's your Harley, Ben. It's your Harley. No. No. Here, Ben. Oh, this is famous Ben Cyril O'Driscoll. We're back. Come on, Cork. So, you passed on the sombrero, Gene. Yeah. He's my apprentice. This will be the next man. He'll be the most popular man in Crow Park in 60 years' time. Do you, think, do you think he knows it yet, that, that that's his face? Uh, I think face? he, he has this instinct already. Look, he's leaving the gear on as it is. Not a mum road of him. He's, All right, Ben. He's, he's an unbelievably well-behaved boy. He's probably the sombrero, is it? Oh, I know. Ah, he's, he's an old toff, this fella. He'll be, he'll be one of the best supporters Cork will ever have. Every, everyone's going to go insane now, Owen, if Cork win. Like, you've no idea what this means to the people of Cork. Like, we've been starved of success, and we t t we're going to do it Sunday. I know we're going to do it, Owen. How oft do my thoughts in their fancy take flight to the home of my childhood away to the days when each patriarch vision seemed bright ere I dream of those joys would decay when my heart was as light as the wild winds that blow down the Mardaig to each elm tree, where we sported and played, need each green leaf be shade on the banks of my own lovely lee. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Ah, uh, Owen, that would bring that would bring a tear to a glass eye. That would make you a Cork fan for the weekend. Like Ben Cyril O'Driscoll, he is the most well-behaved child I think I've ever seen wearing a sombrero. We uh, we had to work around Ben's nap times yesterday in order to get peak Ben uh, to appear on off the ball. So uh, that was uh, the logistical challenge of the ages to ensure uh, it worked out. But boy, did he deliver! And uh, boy, is uh, is he going to take over the, the terrace pretty soon? He was also mentioning there, uh, Cyril, that, that he's um, struggling to get a ticket for the weekend and a lot of genuine fans are struggling to, to get tickets for the weekend because it is an absolute war out there, Shane. Like, I mean, it's 40,000 tickets, obviously, incredibly fortunate to have 40,000 people, but two of the most passionate sporting cities in the country going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. If this was 82,000 people in the stadium, you would suspect that this would be right up there as one of the most legendary battles for tickets Anyway, even if you had people with season tickets guaranteed uh, their spot. So that's the sort of level uh, of anxiety that exists, I guess, within the fan base at the moment. Oh, it's going to be it's gonna be pandemonium getting tickets. It's like for the for the hurling and football finals this year. Like I remember, like I was at the, the 2018 semi-final win when Limerick beat Cork in that absolute classic. And the atmosphere in the stadium, that was obviously with the 80,000 uh, odd people. But... How how you're going to get forty thousand people like sounding like that? I don't know, but certainly if there's two counties that that can try, it'll be these two. Yeah, I was actually at that game as well, and that was just incredible that atmosphere across that entire weekend, but particularly for that game and as things just ratcheted it up and Cork again the accusations that were there over the last few years of them maybe not having to bottle late in the game, and when they did bottle that game, I think. And, uh, and surrendered that six-point lead. It was just this insane atmosphere in there when you were like, oh, hold on, this is what a, a really happy and jubilant Limerick support group sound like. Little did we know at that point that they would actually become the fan group that would have the, the greatest success over the following years. And that's an interesting moment in this rivalry as well, where Cork really feels that they should have been the ones taking on Galway in that year's All-Ireland final. And instead they slipped and they let Limerick in and Limerick got that break and... And they've taken over, you know. So uh, it's it, it's an interesting moment, and I just wonder if three years later we're going to have a, a different moment, a, a new chapter in the rivalry that is that is simmering along. And uh, I know we're going to uh, get to Jamie Wall in a moment. We discussed that rivalry 
because it's a complicated one and the two cities are so far away from each other, it's more the townlands on the border, uh, on the borders of these two counties that maybe have a little bit of a, a dislike for one another. But as it stands, it's not quite on a, on a Cork versus tip level just yet. But, but maybe that changes over the next little while. Like I hadn't realised the quite the um, the disdain uh, and the rivalry in some parts of Cork and Limerick. Like I I, I listened to you chatting to uh, Anya Fitzgerald of the Limerick Leader yesterday morning, and like this whole Charleville thing, uh, the border dispute. Uh, like which county is it actually in? Did you did you get to the bottom of it? No, I I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole, Shane. That is that is <laughs> a, a political story way above my pay grade. This is uh, the, the annexation of a, a certain section of Charleville. Uh, it brings up horrifying memories of, of political stories in, in other countries. So uh, we, we, let the, we let the people of, of Cork and Limerick talk that one out. As far as I was concerned before this, because like, Charleville is Cork, then like, mm. why, why is that even under the dispute? But uh, apparently a little section of it does run through Limerick. So, so that, that is where the rivalry is at its greatest. Uh, and it'll just be interesting to see if, if there is maybe a little bit of needle on the pitch, because I think Cork would probably need to bring that on Sunday. Will that then manifest itself in in the stands and in, in the kind of discourse between these two counties? Because because it's it's, it's uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of respect right now between these these two teams and and it would be nice to, to see a new rivalry actually kind of dominate for the next little while because it's it, it, it feels somewhat novel still having this All Ireland pairing. Like one of your uh, the guests in, in the VT there um, made a very good point that there is a, a whole generation of Cork fans that just haven't experienced the success of The Rock and, and O'Halbin and all, all of these guys. Like, as he said, there are Cork fans in their you know late teens, early 20s that just have not tasted that success whatsoever, which is really interesting and, and adds kind of a, a new strand, a new generation of Cork fans that will be filled with hope heading into Sunday. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And like what great teams they were in 2012. And I'm sure there was plenty of Cork people who thought that after 2005, it would be a, a question of how many they would win over the next few years rather than if they would win one. And to be waiting 15 years plus is just a, an incredible uh, turn, really, for, from their own successes. Like, you can put that down to a number of different things. Like, a lot of people mentioned the strikes when it comes to, to Cork and their lack of success thereafter, whether or not that actually manifested itself in terms of the, the longevity of this drought. I'm not so sure. Uh, Limerick, obviously, have had their own strikes in the past 2010. And maybe that kind of sparked what needed to happen at grassroots level for things to get right for them over the following few years. So you can point at a few different things. The, the elephant in the room is obviously Kilkenny and, and them going to a whole new level and, and stealing Cork people's successes. But it is interesting. There's a slight parallel between this Cork team and the Cork team of 99 that, that came along and looked so good, so young. And this team is so young and they are definitely so, so good. And there are so many different questions about who's going to start and, and who are they going to spring off the bench, which speaks not only of a young team, but of, of, a, of a deep squad uh, and a team that are, are destined to finally give some young Cork people their first taste of real success. Yeah, we'll get to, we'll get to your next piece in uh, in just a moment, Owen. But uh, 7.53 on this Friday morning on OTBA. I just want to bring you uh, what's coming up across the morning until uh, between now and 10 o'clock. We've loads of good stuff. As I mentioned, Jimmy Wall uh, with Owen uh, coming up just next uh, uh, in a few minutes' time. Uh, Damien Delaney, the former Republic of Ireland International, proud Cork man, of course, as well, has also been chatting to uh, Owen. We'll get to him at around 10 past quarter past eight or so. Uh, the GA quick picks as well. The lads are pulling their necks on the line for the All-Ireland Hurling Final. A lot of people backing Limerick. Uh, as I said, the, the five-point uh, swing, the bookies have it, but I feel like it's going to be tighter. We'll see what the lads uh, make of it. Tommy and uh, Will will join Owen. Uh, and myself for the GA Quick Picks uh, from around 8.35 a.m. this morning uh, to, to put their necks on the line for that. Uh, at 8.50 or so, uh, Tommy has been chatting to uh, some of the Mayo uh, heads ahead of the All-Ireland Senior Football Finals with James Horn and Stephen Cohen were up for the Mayo, Mayo uh, Press Day. Loads of interesting stuff and we'll get James uh, Horn's thoughts on that John Small tackle on Owen McLaughlin as well. So uh, really good stuff from uh, Tommy chatting to uh, James Horn and Stephen Cohen over in Mayo. Uh, around 8.50 as well, just after that, we'll uh, hear all about Corkness. Just what is it that makes Cork so special uh, and the uh, the people's capital, uh, as our own Colin Buhig would uh, no doubt call it. Uh, Premier League then with uh, Phil Egan from around 10 past nine or so this morning. So plenty of uh, big games this weekend. We'll have Arsenal, Chelsea, in fact, live on off the ball on Sunday, half past four kickoff for that one. Brian Kerr will be alongside Stephen Doyle for that game on the OTB Sports app and, of course, on News Talk uh, FM radio as well. 
Uh, loads of other good games um, across the weekend. Manchester United against Southampton is another game on Sunday. That's at 2 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, and of course, we look back on Shermock Rovers' uh, 4-2 defeat to Flora Tallinn last night in the Europa League Conference. Playoffs, a uh, disappointing result for them to concede four goals, uh, but not quite out of the tie yet. I know Phil Egan was watching that game last night, so uh, we'll get his thoughts on that. And then from around half past nine, we'll hear from John Giles. He was in conversation with Willow Callaghan uh, on Off the Ball last night, so uh, loads of good stuff from John. Uh, talking pressure on Mikel Arteta, talking Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's tactics, and Manchester United not getting too carried away with the uh, the 5-1 win over Leeds United on the opening day of the Premier League season. Uh, so loads of good stuff to come between now and 10 o'clock this morning. But, uh, Owen, you've been chatting to uh, Jimmy Wall down in Cork. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that. Just you mentioned Colin Bowie there, who, who referred to this as people's public to Cork. Big shout-out to Colin's father, Billy, who uh, let me set up a great piece on, on Glenn Rovers and Christy Ring yesterday, which we'll get to later on. An absolute gent so uh, any people who who like off the ball tennis coverage he comes from good stock our Colin Bowie uh, so Jamie Wall this uh, piece I wanted to get out of the city and just kind of get to somewhere that wasn't the city yesterday to see how people are feeling Jamie Wall uh, his club is killed Britain in West Cork about a 45 minute drive southwest from here and uh, Jamie's obviously coached Mary I he's been involved with Kilmallock in the past so he's got a, a great insight into Limerick obviously since the pandemic everybody's living at home and he's He's gone back down to Cork and he's really got involved in Kilbrick. He's training their intermediate side. I actually kept him from going to watch the, the under-13s playing a match last night, but he's embedded himself uh, right back into coaching and, and with that community again over the last little while. And here he is speaking here uh, about why he loves coaching. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. It's fun. Like, yeah, it's fun. It's what you want to do. And, like, obviously, like, when you get stuck into it, then, like, you know, you want to do it well. And, yeah. you know, just don't get me wrong. Like, we're not going to go up and hold hands and, you know, do play duck, duck, goose up yeah. in the pitch or anything. Like, like we're going to take, like, it's take, so taken seriously. Like, but there's a joy in that even. Like, you know, like, that's, like, like, I think people like to train hard and they like to kind of see how good can I get. But also within a fun environment, like, and with games and, you know, you know, making your sessions fun. Like, and I think that's that's something that, you know, um, I would speak a good bit to one or two of the guys involved with the Cork Miners at the moment and I'm covering their game with TG Carr on Saturday and, um, you know, one of their coaches, a guy called Joe Regan from St. Finbars, who, like, you know, something he always says and, you know, we've spoken about it, is like, like, they have to enjoy it. Like, it has to be fun as well. Like, you know, it can be serious and, you know, you see, you've probably seen their results and their performances. They're a serious team. Mm. Um it can be serious and it should be serious, but it should be fun as well. And like, you know, making it enjoyable for people because, you know, ultimately that's, that's, and it's not like that's, that's also how you get the best results. I would say, you know, it's trying to deliver a kind of a fun learning environment. Like, you know, so you're engaging them, you're making it fun and that's a challenge. And I suppose the element for me, like, obviously like I have gone away from the teaching as a profession, mm. but I think it's the same thing that, you know, I think, I think it's the same kind of, how would I say, like the same kind of draw that drew me to teaching. Right. It's the same kind of, you know, it almost it's almost kind of vocational kind of thing like that. You know, you feel like you want to deliver this thing that brought you so much to someone else and you want to do it right. And you want to do it the right way and you want to help them, you know, reach their potential, but also enjoy reaching their potential. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm not... Um, <laughs> I'm reading Gold in the Water by P.H. Mullen. I don't know if you've read it, but no. the swimming coach in, uh, just needless to say, like that's not quite the angle I'm going at with the lads. They're not, uh, they're not down on the beach there at six in the morning and I'm not flogging the shit out of them. Um, and what are you learning from that? From, from the book? book? From the book. Uh, you're kind of just getting an insight into kind of, we'll say, uh, the various kind of, the various levels in terms of like, various levels of insanity of some coaches yeah. to be quite honest like and like and there's and there's there are things there like you'd be an idiot if you didn't learn certain things from these practices and there's you know these are obviously the elite elite like we're talking about like i'm talking about you know i'm still talking about a club team in west cork versus a you know potential olympic swimmers like so naturally there's a huge huge difference like but um so you're picking up you know, you're kind of saying, right, what elements of that are practical to apply? But I know also, like, you know, um, you're getting an, an idea, you're getting a, a glimpse into kind of, you know, sometimes a glimpse into things being a little bit too far. You're kind of saying, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, like, that's not something I'd like to apply to the way I do things. Like, don't but then obviously there are huge things that you'd be an idiot if you weren't taking them from it either. Like. Yeah, that's really interesting. On the, the West Cork um, 
idea. Like, I mean, I suppose it's it's been quite the year for West Cork, whether it's Netflix or Now TV or um, the Wild Atlantic Way or um, what is what is the um, the contribution of West Cork when it comes to to hurling in the, in this county? Because obviously, the traditional idea is that you know the, the football is West Cork. Obviously, that's that's not true. It's just because it's it's more dominant, obviously, when it comes to to, to footballers within West Cork. So when it comes to hurling, how how much do we underrate this part of the county uh, and their contribution towards Cork? Well, um, oh, you could get me into hot water here because I might start talking about the Cahillans who are, who are strictly speaking from St. Finbars but might also be considered from West Cork. So uh, I played with Damien in it, so it's alright if you want, if you want. <laughs> like I'll have Niall down the phone now. But, uh, so there, there's, well, let's just say that at the very least they have West Cork breathing in them anyway. Um, You've Luke Mead. I went to school with Luke Mead in inside in Bandon. And um, that's that's in terms of the immediate contribution, like um, just across the bay there. Um, I don't know if you remember Mark Foley that scored two seven before in the Munster final for Cork. He's he would have actually played minor with us in the sense that uh, we were joined with them um, as a kind of a minor amalgamation team. Um, they be Argentine Rangers. We're actually playing them in the first round this year. Right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so Mark Mark B Mark would have scored. Mark scored two seven in the Munster final for Cork. Um, and but like obviously, look like West Cork is is predominantly a football area. It's a football area in the same way that you know West Clare is predominantly a football area. But Connor Cleary is from Milltown, and you sure. know he's holding down full back. Um, she, South Tip is a football area in Tipperary, and you've Seamus Kennedy, and you like I would say the best hurler that ever played for Tipperary, Owen Kelly, is from South Tip. So, um, I suppose like it's about like in a county the size of Cork. Um, obviously, you know, people kind of get, you can get a small bit getaways and, you know, south of the viaduct or west of the viaduct is kind of a thing that, that is said about, you know, that hurling kind of, uh, not that it stops, but that there isn't as much of it, like, and there, there probably isn't as much of it, but there are still pockets of of hurling in West Cork and, like, ultimately, like, there is, there's a huge grow for hurling and it, down here, like, you know, we played, um, we played under 15 there a couple of weeks ago against a team, an amalgamation team from Bantry and Kalekill, you know? And they love their hurling. Like mm. they're they're two clubs, St. Columns and Bantry, they're Kilmock and Mogus, they're underrated, but like and they love their hurling, you know, like they are they're there to hurl and they come up as far as us, like it's about an hour for us and they're still in West Cork <laughs> to yeah. us. But like so that, and that's kind of the reality, the geography of, of Cork as well, is that you know, things are gonna get split. But like people love their hurling in Cork wherever they are, and obviously you have a stronger hurling tradition in East Cork and you know, in parts of the city, we'll say than than in parts of West Cork but equally there is a huge grow for hurling in West Cork and it's something that I think you know it's something that I think we've gotten better at um in terms of you know and something that has been credited probably in the last while if you've been reading local media and stuff like where there's been talk about the Rebel Oak squads and you know uh, the work that they've done in terms of trying to trying to make sure we get all the players from all the catchment areas instead of you know before where we might have had just 24 on an underage under 14 squad and like then obviously naturally you know, there's an element of the lads who are in the city playing against lads from the city are already at a higher level and you never catch up to them. Do you know, mm. whereas now there's a bigger focus um, and it, look, I, I, I would go as far as to say like it has culminated in almost close to immediate success at minor and 20 in the last while. Um, but there is a better focus on getting as many of them through to as high a standard as possible and keeping them at as high a standard as possible. I think Kevin O'Callaghan, one of the GDA's games or games promotion officer, um, was talking about that kind of new mantra, I would say, with getting the bodies through it. I think that's something that I think in the next while we will see more hurlers from more hurlers from the less traditional clubs. And that's not to say we don't need the traditional clubs. We absolutely do. Like, yeah. you know, we need the big clubs. You know, you're like, Kerry, you're going to need guys from Crocs. You're always going to need them. But the best player to ever play for Kerry is probably going to be a lad from Spa in yeah. 20 years' time when we go back and look at it, you know? Yeah. So, um, Fossa. Fossa, sorry. Sorry, Fossa. Sorry. Oh, no, Darryl Minan is also. Darryl Minan is pretty good too. <laughs> I just, I, I mixed up my, my slightly smaller clubs in Kerry, but, uh, <laughs> but like, you know, like that's, you need, you need, you need these, you need these bigger clubs like, yeah. you know, Cork will always need the Glen and, and the Bears and getting them, getting the City Club strong again has been a big boost to Cork, but, you know, equally, Seamus Harnady, has come from Gortrew, like you know, St. Ita's, like, and so, like, I know they're in East Cork, but they're they were junior B 10 years ago, like, you know, um, so, like, I think we're getting better at getting more from the places that would we'll say traditionally may not have gotten the same chances, and like, long may that continue because, like, a county the size of Cork has like 
there's a massive natural advantage there, you know, mm. there is. And if, you know, we've had, there's been lots of kind of crying about Dublin's natural advantages lately, et cetera. Um, but it's only in the last 10, 15 years that they've actually harnessed that national, natural advantage. And I suppose for us, like, we haven't yet fully harnessed that. And if we can get to the point where we start harnessing, you know, the sheer population advantage that Cork has in terms of players over everything, then I'm not saying that you'd be dominant, but, you know, Cork, should, Cork shouldn't go through a spell like they have for the last 15, 16 years. They, they just shouldn't. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I think that's been reflected in the attitude to changing practices at different things and so yeah like i've gone i've gone on a bit of a tangent there no, it's, it's interesting <laughs> like you like my blunt instrument approach to the analysis of the all ireland hurling final this week has been to compare uh what cork are doing at the moment to what limerick have already done how blunt is that and how off the mark is that i don't think it's that off the mark at all and i think like ultimately like what you're talking about is organization and getting the most out of what you have you know like limerick have Limerick are, have already gone through that process, we'll say, and, and are getting the most out of their, you know, their resources and their players, like, you know, and they're getting the best of coaches to work at Unrage with their teams and they're trying to get as many through as they can and get the fundamentals so right and they're not as perturbed about what happens at 14s, 15s, 16s, you know, they're more about, like, can we get competitive minor teams through, can we get competitive 20s teams, you know, like, one thing that I think, like, uh, it's a great like I don't know if this was I, I I think it was by design but like you know the I suppose the Alan Connolly Shane Shane Barrett kind of question debate that's been that kind of started in Cork after the boys came on around the 70 69 70th minute mark against Limerick and people were saying oh god they're gone for the 20s no why didn't they spare them for the 20s and I was kind of actually delighted with the decision to be like no they're senior players that's it no they're senior players we're not holding them for the 20s because their senior players, we think they're up to it. You had no guys playing, we'll say the two boys are corner forwards, like you have no guys like uh, Robbie Cotter from Black Rock, Paddy Power had to step up and be a main man, was man mm. in a match last night. You know, you have these guys now who have, like the two lads have got the experience of playing senior and they're going to play probably in an all Ireland final. So you've got two more guys that have been developed at under 20, so now all of a sudden your net is a bit wider again, you know? Yeah. And like just that kind of attitude with, like, I remember Wayne Sherlock, I was covering for TG Carr, Wayne Sherlock said, before they played Dublin in the All-Ireland final, and like, you know, all this talk about how Cork hadn't won an All-Ireland in any grade in hurling for however many years. And that question was put to him, and Wayne Sherlock said, our primary job is to get as many players through to senior level for Cork as possible. And he said this on the biggest day of their year, you know? And I just thought, yeah, there's a guy that gets it like that. He gets big picture. And like, I think we're kind of finally kind of heading towards that big picture thinking that, and it might actually lead lead somewhere, you know, because like that that ultimately like is like uh, there was so much doom and gloom around Cork, and I know like there's everyone's delighted now because they have won the twenties, and it's easy to be wise after the fact that they've won the twenties. There was so much doom and gloom when Cork lost that twenty ones and twenties final, but I was kind of like they've got to the final, they've got to two finals, they've played five games. Those players are now going to develop, like you know, like they, they've got the the full year. It was way worse back when, like, we'll say, when I was under 21, we went out in our first round and we got the shit hammered out of us by tip. Do you know, we got bet asunder. That's, that's a disaster of a year. Yeah. The boys losing the final by a point or two here or there, that's not a disaster because they've gotten a year's development at inter-county level, you know, and I suppose that thing with Alan Connolly and Barrett, where it's like, they're going to get the year's development here at senior. They're good enough to come on senior. We're using them senior. That's it. They're senior. You go find and develop two, three more players, do you know? And that's kind of the thinking that especially a county the size of Cork should be thinking. You know, they should be saying, we have enough bodies, let's go get more and let's yeah. get more and let's get more. Because like, look at how strong Dublin have been the last couple of years. Like they're introducing fellas, they were winning Auburn Cups there a couple of years ago and you were kind of saying, I don't know who any of these people are and they're gone out beating proper Leinster teams in the finals and stuff, you know? The higher the standard you can raise, you know, from the bottom up, like the better chance you have at senior level. So that's kind of a, that similar kind of big picture thinking, basically, like, and and that's been kind of I think that's been evident in the yeah. last while, you know. The two lads from the, the under twenties going to the seniors is a really interesting case study because, in my mind, I could totally forgive any manager who was like, no, they're staying because you want to win the twenties, but actually having the big picture, big the the the, the 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 wherewithal to be able to say, no, there is a bigger question here than just those two lads being there. 
that speaks volumes, really. And to then, then to win it without the big, big time. But like, like you, had, you had six forwards there um, the other night. Like you had um, uh, Dara Flynn, Daniel Hogan, Brian Hayes, uh, Jack Callan, Robbie Cotter, and Paddy Power. And you've Ben Cunningham coming off the bench, and you know Luke Harden coming off the bench. So you've eight guys there, right? Like straight away, two of them are going to miss out mm-hmm. if you hold these two guys. And like these two guys, these two guys who are ready for senior have their all Ireland final tomorrow. Like, yeah. Why? What, what? Like, what are you holding them for? Like, it is still like, and it's great. Like, you know, you see like the outpouring and how important it is to win a twenties and win a minor, and it's hugely important to the players, especially. Like, I've played them. I've lost the final in both. Um, and it's devastating, but equally, like, it's someone else's job to think big picture and say, right, how can we get... Now, like, now instead of it being eight, you've got ten fellas. Yeah. You've got ten Cork 20-year-olds that'll have played in an All-Ireland final at the end of this weekend, instead of eight, or instead of six, or instead of seven, you know? So, like, that's... To me, it makes to me it makes perfect sense when someone when someone is able to step back and say, this is the plan, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I think long-term, they will benefit a lot from it, and I think it's the kind of thinking that Limerick have applied in the last 10, 15 years. Like, not mirrored, we'll say, because they, they haven't been in that situation, but, you know, I think it's the kind of thinking that they've applied to their own race development over the last while as well and has stood them in pretty good stead for going into this weekend. So it definitely seems to have done. Um, I was up in Kilmanock yesterday. Your, your name was mentioned uh, when I was up there saying that I was uh, coming down to, to Cork. Uh, what is your lasting memory from, from your time in Limerick? And, and what, what is the Limerick-Cork rivalry actually like from your point of view? It's interesting. Like I actually never thought there was a Limerick Cork rivalry, um, because we're so far down south here that you don't get a taste of it at all. Um, and then when I went to Kilmallock, um, I remember my first year there. Like I, obviously I've been in Limerick for a couple of years in Mary I, and again didn't really ever get a Limerick Cork thing. Like, kind of, you know, we had Limerick lads, we had Cork lads. wasn't a big deal. Um, very fond of the Limerick lads. It was fine. And then when I was in Kilmallock, um. I kind of remember my first year there was the year Limerick beat Cork in the semi-final. And I remember the week or two leading up to it, kind of a few of the lads, um, you know, would have said one or two things and kind of like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Like, you're kind of just messing, like, folks, like, you'll be this, that, and the other thing. And I was kind of like, I'll be honest, like, I wasn't overly bothered by the whole thing. I was kind of like, yeah, look, I'd love Cork to win, but equally I was like, I like Galan, I like Lynch, I like Richie. Yeah. I felt like I was kind of like lads look like trying here to just coach a team here. Like, yeah, yeah. Do you know, like that's going to be Kieran and Donald's problem. Like, I could like, you know, I go watch the game and I support Cork on the day, like, but I'm not losing any energy over this during the week. Mm. But they're border lads, you know, like they're and you and like the Cork Limerick thing to them was a thing, and I had never realized it was a thing. Do you know what I mean? And then last year with the club. At home here, I had a selector from Newton Chandram. He's living in the parish, and he's uh, he played with uh, played with one and all Ireland midfield with Newton Chandram, two thousand three. Ian Killer is his name. Right. Uh, he was involved with Cork before um, as a player, and then later as a masseuse. And Ian hates Limerick. Like, yeah, I'm in a WhatsApp group with him still, and he fucking hates <laughs> Limerick. Like, and he's like anyone but Limerick, and I'm kind of like. Oh, like I don't care. Like I'm kind of like if we had to lose anyone, I'd like it to be Limerick. You know, yeah. <laughs> like and uh, oh, he hates him. Like he's just like oh, like and and I and so it's a kind of amazing to me. Like so, like from my perspective, there was no Cork Limerick thing until I actually realised Jesus right or up around Charleville, Newton, Chandram, Kilmallock. Yeah. There is actually a a thing here. Like you know, there's a there's a bite there. But like generally speaking, like I I don't know. Is it um is it that kind of I don't know, like, uh, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here. Like like I said, because I'm not from yeah. that border area, do you know? Um, it doesn't seem that. It doesn't seem that, no. It, yeah, it doesn't. And I don't think it is. Like, I think, um, I feel like Limerick Tip is worse, actually. Yeah. Funny enough. I feel like Limerick Tip. And Limerick Clare probably is. And Limerick probably. Clare is worse. And Tip Clare is worse. And Cork Tip is probably worse Cork as well. Cork Tip definitely is worse. And Cork Tip is worse. Yeah. So, like, I kind of feel like it's kind of always been a, generally speaking, been a kind of a bit of a, a, a healthy rivalry with not no major animosity but then you know like what can change that then is this weekend can is change guys, the, a massive is, brawl is a, a big uh, a big royal or no inside yeah. Grand Park that's uh, ice hockey style um, I know it looked like a, kind of I had never gotten any major vibes off it we'll say but um, that being said like I said it's funny how the week of a match does tend to bring up whatever is there it did bring it up you know mm. and after they won like a uh, 
a few of the lads said it to me on the Tuesday night, you know, a few of the young fellas. Like, we actually played, I remember we played, we played a challenge match in Leash against Clock Balakala, who just won the Leash Championship there this weekend, actually. We played them on the Saturday, and the Limerick lads were all out. So our lads could go up on the Saturday night and go out. The Clare Galway game was on, you know, that night, and Cork Limerick were playing on the Sunday. So we were all up, and I, I like, actually ended up meeting some of the lads inside in Ryan's, you know, and passing, whatever. I was with my friends from college and just chatted to them, Grant, whatever. And they were like, oh, we were going to, yeah, yeah, Grant, best of We'll see you on Tuesday, trying to grab a seat Tuesday. Grant, and met them Tuesday, and they were all like, oh, And again, like, I, I was kind of like, look, lads, like, you won, like, I like, don't really give shit. Like, best of luck, I hope you win the final. Like, like um, great. Like, I, I, I was disappointed for an hour or two, and like, grand like but yeah, yeah, yeah. um but like it was there right like so it's just a funny one but i don't think i don't think it's a one that there's any real badness in to be quite honest OCB AM. yeah really great stuff from uh, jimmy wall there of course a fitzgibbon cup winning manager with mary i and limerick but a proud cork man as you heard in conversation with owen there if you missed that or any other uh, bits from the show this morning you can uh, after the show after 10 o'clock get the uh, the podcast of course on the otb sports app so not to be missed especially if you're a cork fan in the build-up to uh, sunday afternoon half past three of course cork against limerick in the all-ireland senior hurling final tommy welsh will be on updates for us on sunday with uh, joe in the hot seat for that one so uh, plenty of build-up as well on the show vincent hogan and sarah o'donovan will join joe in the build-up to that game it is 8 16 a.m on this friday morning pack show still to come here on Friday morning's OTB AM, brought to you by Gillette. Good mornings start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Now, we'll have all the uh, colour and noise still from Cork in the build-up to the All-Ireland, All-Ireland final still to come across the show this morning. We're back after these with Damien Delaney. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. The guy from Ballarog came down and sat beside me. He said, I take the draw and I said, I'd go home. I said, no. I said, this is the time. I said, if we're going to do it, now is the time and you can sense it. Robbie, I, I could honestly say, is probably the best teammate I've ever had in my whole career. Like, I know I got caught badly jumping up and down like food and stand. <laughs> some of that was for me, oh, but some of that was for Robbie. Download the OTB Sports WhatsApp and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Yeah, very welcome back to Friday morning's OTB AM. 8.18 AM this morning and uh, very often here on OTB AM and at Off The Ball generally... We speak to the former Crystal Palace and Republic of Ireland international defender, Damien Delaney. But generally, it's about football. Now, Owen popped out to meet him in Cork yesterday afternoon to hear about his background in GEA ahead of this Sunday's All-Ireland Senior Hurling Final. Enjoy. OCB AM. All right, Damien Delaney, this is a, a strange time to be getting in touch with you to meet up in Cork because it's All-Ireland Hurling Final Week and I wanted to do the GEA story of Damien Delaney. So uh, <laughs> you, you kick this off for us. When, when I say GEA and Damien Delaney, what, what, what comes to mind first? Um, street leagues uh, in, in, in Blackrock Hurling Club, uh, St. Michael's uh, GEA Football Club. That's where I, I, I started out. Um, and I kind of did that up to a, a certain age. I think it was 12 or 13, but then I kind of drifted down the soccer route. Um, I went to uh, St Anthony's uh, Boys School here in Cork and we were relatively successful. I think we were in a city that was Skeena Skull and, uh, and, and a county, whatever that one was, was called. And then obviously focused on soccer for uh, uh, some time, but then went to Cross to Career 3 here in Cork um, School, which is a, a renowned Gaelic football school. Um, Nemo, uh, Rangers and the Bars really were predominantly the, the, the clubs and... and, and uh, ended up playing that because we didn't have soccer, um, but my GA career in, in Clash Career 3 was under 16 and a half, which is Corny Veron, I think, mm. and then 18 and a half was Corny Veree, um, and we won both of those. 
Um, and I suppose on the strength of that, then I, I kind of drifted a away a little bit from St. Michael's, um, stopped playing hurling altogether. Um, hurling, I really hurling wasn't for me. So, um, uh, and then one summer I got a phone call late uh, to go and play Cork Minor in 1999. The soccer season had finished, and someone had said to me that um, um, Frank O'Connell, uh, who is uh, Owen O'Connell, who plays at Rochdale's grandfather. Um, and I think he's a nephew of Paul O'Connell. Right. Don't quote me on that. No, you'd have to do. You'd have to say that yourself. <laughs> but I think in and around that. But but Frank phoned me and Frank said to me, "Look, what are you doing for the summer?" I said nothing. I said, "Look, uh, do you want to go and play Cork Minor?" And this was a week before they played Limerick in the Munster semi-final. No, bearing in mind these lads have been hard at it since January, and I kind of rolled in in the May, the week before Championship, um, and uh, ended up having a, a, an unbelievable summer um, out of nowhere, really. Um, uh, won a Munster title against Kerry down in Parky Keeve and then went on to the All-Ireland series which he lost to uh, Mayo. Right. I want to touch, well, that's amazing actually, Mayo coming out on top in the end. Uh, can you take us back a little bit to before that? Because yeah, yeah. your dad played hurling for Cork, right? Yeah, yeah my dad was uh, was uh, played hurling for Cork in 88. Um, he was very successful at minor and the 21 level, um, multiple um, All-Ireland medals. Uh, mine under 21 level and then went up to senior level uh, and I think uh, for a period of time as well he was for footballers he was so goalkeeper to Billy Morgan right. uh, for a number of years so um, uh, that was geez I think it was a hurling was late 80s the football might have been mid 80s I think it was and then he kind of but he, he played hurling for Black Rock and has um, a few county medals as well for Black Rock so yeah my, my, my dad was a, a GA man um, that's more. interesting so he Picked football. Football was his first love. Then was it over hurling or, or no? No, I no. definitely hurler. Oh, you know, right. um, I suppose there was someone sent me a photograph recently. Um, my dad captained Black Rock to the first fela in 1974, I think it was. Right. Uh, up in Tipperary. So when fela uh, was 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 brought in, um, but if you look at the names that were on that under uh, fela's under 14, I think it was a 14 and a half or yeah. something like that. Um, you know. Uh, there's a lot of names that went on, you know, the the, the Cashman uh, fellas, uh, Tom and Jim Cashman, I suppose, they were all involved along there as well. So, um, yeah, look, I, I, I don't have it nailed down, to be honest, he doesn't speak a whole pile about it, but yeah, he was a, a pretty good hurler, yeah. Why were you a footballer then and not a hurler? What, what happened there? Um, I suppose I've been honest with you, I think I was about 12 and... Um, uh, I got a serious injury <laughs> playing hurling. I think I tried to. I remember I tried to. Uh, actually, do remember it clearly. I tried to hook someone, and um, I pulled down. I shattered my hand uh, at 12 years of age, and I suppose that kind of turned me off hurling. How, uh, how bad are we talking here? Oh, like bad, hospital yeah, treatment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cast the whole nine yards. Yeah, I remember I brought my hand. Um, I was never really. I, I was never really a hurler. My dad never pushed me down that that, that route. Like, but. Um, yeah, I think that injury just kind of turned me off. It really, you know, it's traumatic for a 12-year-old. <laughs> I think I realised I wasn't cut out for that world. <laughs> it's a brutal enough game now, but in the 70s and 80s, I'd imagine it's a, it was a different level. Yeah, I think that was it, yeah. Um, so I just got a... I remember I, I shattered my thumb and my, my, one of my, my, my fingers as well. So I was in a cast for, for, for the summer, which I wasn't best pleased about. But I never went back to hurling after that. Right. Um, and I kind of focused on uh, soccer. And GA was always kind of a, a, a side... I suppose to, to to my soccer, you know. It's interesting there that you said that your dad didn't really mention it too much. The fact that he played for Cork and all that, so it, that obviously wasn't a big part of your childhood going to watch your dad play or anything like that. Um, oh, not really. Um, I think uh, you know my dad. I think my dad kind of gave up the hurling in in in, in the late eighties. Um, so I would have been like maybe ten. So no, he wasn't massive on that. He was never someone that would drag us along and make us watch hurling matches. Not 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 ever. But um, you know, obviously. He, he never talks about it, but other people would say, tell you stories, you know, and you meet people along the way and um, people would obviously tell you stories about winning counties for Black Rock or, or, um, or, or playing for Cork um, in the late 80s. Um, I think he was sandwiched, I think Cork won in All-Ireland in 86 and 80 and 90. And I think my dad played uh, in, in the period in between that. Oh, <laughs> so he just missed out on, um, on, 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 um, on an All-Ireland. Your dad not talking about his success sounds like the quintessential Irishman. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, he would very rarely, you'd never see anything. You wouldn't see the medals or anything like that. You know, your mother would tell you uh, a little bit about it, but it was more just kind of small talk with people that you met around Cork growing up, you know. Yeah. Um, but he would never really speak about that much. But he never really pushed me down that route either. Him being a hurler, 
you know, you, you think that he pushed down that route, but uh, I think when I brought my hand, he realised it wasn't for me either. So <laughs> I think he knew I wasn't made of the right stuff. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what did he expect? Nothing's made of platinum or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it is amazing when you think about all the core figures that do have linked between football and hurling, like I mean, soccer and hurling, like whether it's the Milers, the Egans, the Barry Murphys, yeah, uh, yeah. like it, it is incredible. Like, is it, do you think that's indicative of of the fact that this is just like a melting pot of a city, really, and there's no real pressure or no real pathway that you're pushed down to play one specific sport? Um, I don't know. I think there are probably pushy parents out there that that, that push. No, I can't speak f for any of the lads you just mentioned there. Um, but I was never pushed down any route. You know, I was almost just left whatever you enjoy. You you, you did it. I'm pretty sure if I went home one day and I told my dad I want to do tap dancing, he'd have. He'd have took me tap dancing, you know. Um, so I never felt any 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 real pressure um, to, to to be a hurler or anything. But yeah, maybe Cork's a big a big county, um, big city as well. And um, obviously, there's a huge tradition here with, with GEA um, and and soccer also too. So look, all those lads you mentioned there have gone on to have fabulous careers, and I think their dads were were, were, were fabulous GEA men as well. Um, so maybe they did have a similar similar upbringing to me. How soon after your uh, Cork minor do you realise that the football thing is going to take off? Uh, the soccer, soccer thing is yeah. Off. Um, well, yeah. As I said to you, the GA was 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 just to fill a summer really. Yeah. You know, um, I, I I never had any real desire to, to 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 play GEA, but I suppose I was knocking around for the summer, and my dad said to me, look, rather than just kind of messing around for the summer you might as well do something and I'm delighted I did do it um, but you know the force course uh, here in Cork I started that in that August um, so after we won the Munster against Kerry and Parky Keeve which was still a day that stands out in my mind you know to beat for someone like me I, I understood the significance of beating Kerry you know in Parky Keeve a rainy Parky Keeve in July um, you know and because the, the Cork and Kerry were in a senior game it was my first uh, experience of a large crowd Right. I remember coming out uh, the second half and it was full. And this was when Parky Keeve was was Parky Keeve. There was 45, 50,000 there, yeah. um, which was daunting enough. Se you know, first half in the minor game at half one. You know, you always you, you'd hear people shuffling in and some people were watching the game. But I think by the time the second half was underway, it was full. Um, so as I said, I do understand the significance of that, and, and that was a, 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 an unbelievable day that still stands out in my mind. Um, but then the FOSS course started in, in early August and yeah, the FOSS course actually overlapped with the back end of the, 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 the All-Ireland series. So um, I do remember, um, you know, the FOSS course was run out in Bishops down here. I do remember doing double football sessions in the FOSS course and then going straight from, from the farm in UCC to Parky Ring. <laughs> so I was doing like three sessions a day for, for a number of weeks um, and I remember there was a couple of the, the GA lads knew what was going on Teddy Holland was the was the manager um, and he was very very good very very good to me and, and understood the situation but I think there was a few a few GA people around there that, 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 that frowned upon my <laughs> frowned upon my choices of coming straight from a, a soccer session to a, to a GA session but um, you know that was only for a short period of time while the All-Ireland series was being run off um, and, and, and once we got beaten in that it was forgotten about and I was just straight into the straight into the uh, the, the false course it's interesting. Um, oh, sorry, what did you study in the FOSS course, actually, by the way? Or that was that was your pathway into into football. football. Yeah, FOSS that was football course, like did, yeah. did they? Because I'm, I'm always interested in that. Cause I've heard you mention that before. Was there actually an, an education element to that as well? No, it was literally no, just no, football. No, I, think, I, think, I think I was on the the, the second and third one. Uh, Colin Healy and uh, Liam Miller were on the first one, I think, um, and then I went on the second one. And this was when it was a case of bring your boots. We're doing two right. football sessions a day. Right. No, I know there's modules and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they, they get fellas uh, uh, set up for, for life. You know, they do get some education of some description. Yeah. But with us, I, 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 it was talking at best, you know. Um, it was run out of the, the ESB club in Bishopstown. And I think we did have some lessons once a week. But, I mean, it was double football Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. That was, you know, it was a professional football set up. Right, OK. Um, that moment against Kerry that you talk about there, because you, you said that a while ago before we went on air that sometimes recalling specific events, it doesn't come easily to you or that, that maybe dates and, and moments. I'm getting the impression off this Kerry game that that's maybe an exception to the rule. Yeah, absolutely, bit. yeah. I mean, you can't grow up in Cork without understanding the Cork and Kerry rivalry, you know. Um, and I was lucky enough to see, you know, uh, Cork beat Kerry in, in, in the 90s. Um, I think uh, was it, I watched a documentary recently with Dinny Allen 
um, when they won the football in 1990. I mean, they'd lost something like 12 monsters. Again, I might be wrong there, but I remember, you know, growing up and experiencing that. Um, but so to, to get to play at Parky Keith against Kerry in a Cork jersey um, and win was, was absolutely uh, fantastic, you know, and obviously some great teammates. We had a fabulous minor team that year, a really, really good minor team. Lads who went on had a, a, a fabulous um, All-Ireland. People like Ronan Kern was in it now, Tom Kenny was there, um, Noli O'Leary, right. who went on and, and played foot, won All-Ireland for Cork in 2010, but, but Tom and um, Niall McCarthy, um, geez, if I went through it now, people like David Niblock went on and had good careers for, for, for Nemo and stuff, but there was an awful lot of GA all Ireland medals came out of that minor team. I just kind of drifted the the, the, the other way to soccer. Was there ever any part of your brain at that time when you see a full parky cleave of 40,000 people being like, hold hold on double football at the fourth course for a moment here. I actually kind of like the, the feel of this. Um, no, <laughs> would be the, would be the short answer. I still understood that I was only a blow in for the summer. Um, and I, I listen. I played. It was fabulous. I played midfield, and as I said, all those experiences to play against Mayo in, in Crow Park, you know. You know, for me, for, so I've I've played uh, GEA in Crow Park and soccer in, in Crow Park. I, I'm sure there's a quiz question in there somewhere about the amount of fellas that have actually yeah. done that. I can't imagine it being many. I mean, there's probably a few rugby lads that 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 played um, um, rugby for Ireland and 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 GEA. So um, for me to go out and it was the old Hogan stand as well. You know, but the change rooms were down in the corner, and there were like little caves. And I remember running out, and um, I think it was the Cusack was uh, was the only stand. Then it was the it was the old stadium. You know, with the old is the Nally stand down in the corner yeah. with the scoreboard. You know, I, all that. I, I absolutely remember that. And um, I think Cork, Cork were playing Mayo in the senior game as well. So again, similar. Nice. Crow Park was full for the second half, which was 60, 70,000 at the time. Um, so that was a, a, a wonderful experience. And again, held. Held, held me firm for, for, for what was to come in my soccer career in terms of playing in front of a crowd, learning and experiencing. Um, uh, so, yeah, listen, all that helped and it was fantastic, but I, I do treasure those memories, absolutely, yeah. Class. And do you remember who you were marking that day against Kerry or anything? Um, yeah, I do, but I can't remember his name. Um, he went on to win multiple All-Irelands. Um, I think Paul Galvin played in that game right. uh, for Kerry, but the fella the midfield, there was a... Ah, oh, geez, I'd listen. I told him uses with names. There was a fella I marked midfield for Mayo in 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 that game, and he went on to play rugby for Ireland. Wasn't Gavin Duffy was that? That's it, yeah. That yeah. was him, yeah. Gavin Duffy, yeah, right. yeah. So there's a, there was a picture of me. I got sent. I got sent a few times of me and him competing for a ball. Right. And obviously the two of us finished that game and went our separate ways. He went to rugby, and I went to um, went to to soccer. Um, but the Kerry team, if you get it, I. Jeez, I do. I have. There's a program at home somewhere, and then the names I wouldn't know because I left and I missed all Kerry's success. Um, but a lot of them went on to win multiple All Irelands in in that minor team. Galvin is the one that stands out because I remember it. It might have been Paul Galvin and Noel O'Leary's first hurdle. Well, I was just about to say. That's <laughs> yeah. literally what I was going to say. That's really interesting. I think it might be, but again, that's probably one for you to research. <laughs> what was Noel O'Leary like back then? Ah, uh, no. Ah, listen. I tell you, there's not many men. Would frighten me, but Noli still frightens me. <laughs> I play golf with him now a few times, like, and um, yeah, Noli uh, has a, a stare, or, or you know, there's something behind the eyes where one wrong word and it could be the end of your life. <laughs> um, it is, of course, hurling final weekend rather than football final weekend. Um, have you paid close attention to the Cork hurlers this year? Is it something that, that, that gets you, gets the blood flowing? It has the last when it's got serious, you yeah. know, uh, when it got to the, the, the monster kind of end of the business but in so far as league no it wouldn't be a huge league but I would watch sit down and watch Cork hurling absolutely yeah I'd be one of the first ones to sit down and um, and watch a hurling game and um, they were fantastic against Kilkenny you know enough can't be said uh, for the performance that they put in and I hope that they um, they do go on and win it will they do you think I think they can do. It's going to be extremely difficult. Um, it's not going to be one of those ones where they show up. I think they're in a good place because I think they know they're underdogs. I, th I feel that they, they are. I think Limerick will obviously be favourites. But I think it's a good place for them to be, you know, to be just behind and a lot of the noise of people like me saying that they don't expect a, a whole pile because Limerick are favourites. But I think when you're an underdog uh, and you're a Cork team, I think um, it's the right place to be. You can slide in under the radar and then decide everything in 70 minutes, all the talk like this beforehand and afterwards doesn't matter. For them, it's what happens in the, in the 70 minutes that they're, they're out there. Um, and I think they're the best tip, equipped team. I think they physically, from what I've seen against Kilkenny, I mean, they were physically far superior than Kilkenny. Um, I think 
uh, Kilkenny just kind of ran out of steam. But I think Cork have the physicality, the fitness, um, and the athleticism to, to match Limerick. And they're probably the one team in Ireland, I think, that can do some damage for, uh, for, for to, to, to Limerick. OTB AM. Yeah, great stuff as always from Damien Delaney there, of course, the former Crystal Palace and Republic of Ireland international defender. But talking about GEA on this occasion alongside uh, our own Owen Sheehan and his own uh, GEA uh, upbringing, of course, down in Cork and uh, a look ahead, of course, to Sunday's All-Ireland final against Limerick. Plenty of good stuff from Damien there. Uh, right now on OTB AM, it is 8.35 AM on this Friday morning. It's time for our GEA Quick Picks. So many critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them, lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. OK, we are into the business end. It has been emotional at the end of the hurling predictions this weekend as we look ahead to Lord, uh, Limerick versus Cork in the All-Ireland Hurling Final. I've just noticed Shane Hannon is uh, in his Cork colours. We'll get your prediction in just a moment, Shane. Uh, Tommy and Will, you're both with us. There's been no change to the scoreboard after last week, which means, Tommy, you're still out in front. Um, do we want to talk about last week? Do we want to talk about the fact that I've managed to save all of your bacon by pressing the big red button on Dublin hammering and you guys have got away scot-free, even though you also got it spectacularly wrong? I, th I think we have to start with last week, Will. I think we do, and... Like, Owen here is saying that he, he saved our bacon. He absolutely did not. There's one thing that Owen did do, and he's obviously done great work this week down in Limerick and in Cork, and we were hoping to send him to the football counties ahead of the All-Ireland Final. But I don't know if we're going to be able to send him to Mayo, because by God, did he, did he annoy some Mayo fans. I think we can see a little something here from Mayo's most famous, we'll say, export, expat, Kevin Kilban. So the snob Adrian Barry has compared Mayo to a character from a geeky make-believe TV show with monsters and dragons and Owen Sheehan compares him to someone who goes to the dance but goes home alone. Asher, that's it then. No wonder I don't return their calls. <laughs> he, 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 he certainly uh, I, I, he certainly has uh, returned a few calls during the week, I must say. Like, as, as Did you as try him? <laughs> As recently as two days ago, he was still a common thing, saying that I tipped Mayo by uh, 10 plus points on Instagram. So uh, it's good good to see this, that they, they've, um, they, they get over things quickly. But I mean, I, I, I disagree with your point there about not being welcome to Mayo. This is the whole reason that they won. I mean, Mayo would love nothing better than to prove somebody wrong. And look, if, if there wasn't somebody tipping double by 10 points, then you wouldn't have had that opportunity, Mayo, is all I'm going to say. Um, Will, you're, uh, were you tempted at all? I, from, from your analysis last week, I kind of remember you were kind of half tempted with Mayo. Do you regret that now, Weekend? No, he wasn't. No, nah, I was. No, nah, oh, I sorry, think Tommy, it's I'm not Adrian Barry who was, who was uh, closest to wanting no. to switch. I'm actually quite glad we didn't give him the option to switch in the end. I know Ushie Mullen was ruled out entirely, but mm. he was kind of dangling before he actually made that prediction by the end of last week. But look, nobody really saw it coming. Maybe Owen, you were the inspiration on the back of the dressing room wall for James Horn. This guy saying it's going to be 10 points to Dublin and you shook Kevin Kilban, you know, out of his uh, Canadian TV based uh, home <laughs> he's had recently uh, where he came on to OTB this week. He said he wasn't going to return the calls. I saw him talking to Joe on the football show. I think it was on Tuesday. Uh, yeah. So you can take uh, personal responsibility for Kevin Kilban uh, reappearing on our airwaves here in Ireland as well. Before we move on, I would just like to, to rubbish that that Adrian Barry deserves any any credit whatsoever for trying to cover himself. That's all he was trying to do last week. He was trying mm -hmm. to cover himself. He did describe Mayo as the eunuchs of the All Ireland Football <laughs> Championship. <laughs> <laughs> so if if and if there's one thing that Mayo proved is that there are yeah okay right if, uh, if, if if nothing else it was it was a very funny line. Darrow too has been in touch to say no show from AB after referring to Mayo as the eunuch of the All-Ireland. It is an absolute disgrace. <laughs> uh, yeah, I must say, you're, you're right, Will. Telecommunications systems seem to improve all across Canada over the course of the last week. I don't know what happened. It's just a massive <laughs> coincidence. This week, we'll start with you, Will. What are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking Limerick probably by six, I think is the exact prediction I put in about an hour ago. Again, they've won by eight points the last couple of times that the teams have met. I think Cork are going to take a lot of inspiration from two things getting to the extra time against Kilkenny after it felt like they had maybe thrown it away where once again, a bit like 2018, they were six points up going down the stretch. 
there had to be some feelings in the back of their mind. Here we go again. We're going to lose another big game. They're on the back of winning three championship games in a row, which is the first time in a long time. Um, so many of these players are coming into the game entirely fresh with Cork too, where they don't have the mental scarring of defeats that they had previously. You're only really talking two or three players who were around in 2013 that played in the replay against Clare uh, when they lost that All-Ireland final. So for Cork, the weight of history is not there. They kind of remind me a little bit of Limerick in 2018, uh, where Limerick came in with quite a bit of abandon, where Seamus Hickey, who I spoke to on last night's off the ball, was the only player that was still around from the final in 2007. And he said that was probably helpful, that those players were going in with no memory of having gone to Crow Park and have had disappointments. But I think for this Cork team, and they will definitely be taking some inspiration, lads, from the way that their underage teams have been playing, maybe the Rebel treble will happen by Sunday. But I think this year is probably just a year or two too soon uh, for Cork to overcome Limerick. Uh, so my expectation is that Limerick are going to write themselves into the annals of history as one of the great teams by going back to back in the Liam McCarthy. It's the one thing that's missing on the CV for this group of players, particularly over the last four seasons. And despite the fact, as Damien rightly points out, the Cork are very well set up athletically to mix it against Limerick. And stylistically, they're even quite similar to Limerick in that they're not going to deviate away from their short puck out. They're still going to try and run the ball through the lines and they're going to try and get the ball into that forward line to score goals. And they've scored a lot of goals in the championship this year, including a couple against Limerick when they met the last time. But I think Limerick are about six or seven points the better team, as we've seen in the two meetings so far. I think we're going to see something similar this weekend. Tommy, which way are you leaning? Owen, uh, you know me, I tried to make the case in my head all week that Cork were going to do it. I've, I've, Cork have done me well over the last couple of weeks in the quick picks, and I really like their style of play. I think Will's nailed it there, though. Um, and, I, and the point I'd make is that there's been a lot of comparisons between Limerick and Dublin on this show ever since Kieran Carey made that point. Was it two years ago? Maybe maybe 12 months ago, we'll say. Um, Limerick are not on the slide. Like this Limerick team, I'm not sure if they've even reached their peak yet. And like we know Cork are on the rise and, and there's there's really good things happening in Cork Hurling. And I just think they're going to fall short. I just think that they have, they just have a couple of falls that they've, they've got away with. You know, they got by Kilkenny um, after extra time, but they, they did let them back into that game. They could have been caught by Clare. And I just think the way we saw Limerick swat away Waterford in that semi-final, I just think that Limerick going to have too much in the day. I've gone relatively conservative. I, I do think that Cork will be in this game. I really think they do. I think Limerick might pull away once or twice and Cork will I'll bring them back. And then Limerick will just have too much in the end. Um, and it'll be, a, you know, four points is the difference that I'm going for. I'm interested to see that you've gone very close. You're the man who's been in Limerick. You spent 24 hours in Limerick and now you spent 24 hours in Cork and you are not getting caught by going with an all-out 10-point win again on. Listen, I mean, I, I try to bring some sort of stardust and razzle-dazzle and uh, like excitement to the quick picks last week and we all saw what happened. So I'm going to just pick a two-point win for the favourite from here on out. As long as this quick fix is going on, I'm just going to pick the favourite by two points. Or <laughs> like, cause, like, I mean, that's clearly how you play this game. Uh, that's clearly how you, you save yourself. So who cares really about, about this whole thing? I'm not going to come back from the dead in, in this game. I'm at the bottom of the table. It's all he's, over. He's looking I, at this as nine points to play. I'm going to try and pick up as many the nine as I possibly yeah. can. Then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I do think it's, it's going to be narrower than maybe people would have thought couple of weeks ago. I don't know I don't know why. It feels that the, the manner in in which Cork came back in the semi final has completely changed how we view this Cork team. And uh I, I just think that maybe the criticism of Cork was then to do with their mentality and to do with the, the, the winning nature of this team. I think we all questioned that. And whatever happened in that semi final, it was like, hold on, there is something special about this team because that was that was a special win. It was crazy. And uh, maybe uh, Limerick well, Limerick definitely would have seen that game out in, in normal time. But I don't think you can actually put a uh, too fine a point on on how much that will have brought this Cork team on over the last few weeks. That experience of, of going to the well uh, against Cork. It's gonna be it's gonna be fascinating. Like uh, I'm I'm not sure. Like by the way, we should mention that Adrian's gone for an eight point win for Limerick for, for people who are who are listening to us on OTB Sports Radio. So what did he tip Mayo or he tipped Dublin last week only by a couple of points and he referred to Mayo as Unix. So mm. I don't know what he's gonna say about Cork. Like I mean the people of Cork out there, you should be absolutely furious with Adrian Barry. You're worse than a eunuch in his eyes, uh, which is a, a terrible description. Uh, but that's, that's what he's going for. I'm going on the other end of things, a, a two-point win 
uh, for Limerick entirely. Uh, Shane Hannon, what, what are you thinking with regards to this? Like, yeah, I don't know what the opposite of a eunuch is, but that's probably what Limerick hurling is. Um, and it is Stoked. tough to <laughs> it is tough to make an argument against Limerick, but lads, I'm going to do it. I'm gonna, I'm wearing red for a reason this morning. I, I'm going to try and make the argument for Cork because you've all touched on different things there. Like, um, I think Shane Masicki with with yourself with last night talked about Patrick Horgan, how he's improving over the years. Uh, spoke about his consistency. Like he's been in eight All Ireland semi finals. Uh, just his second final now upcoming on Sunday. He deserves an All-Ireland, um, but you have to earn it. But this this core team, I think you touched on it, Will, like the confidence they're going to take from that that um, semi-final. Like they, they had the game won, they lost it again, and then they won it again in extra time. They're going to take serious, serious confidence from that. They have to be there with, with 15, 20 minutes to go uh, to have any chance. They probably need goals as well to beat Limerick, as any team does. Um, but if they play like they like they normally do, as Tommy mentioned, that free flowing, pacey style, like they have every they have every chance. That Cork full forward line need to put serious pressure on on the Limerick uh, full back line, but they can do it. It's 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 in some ways a free shot for Cork. Um, probably more pressure on Limerick heading into this one. A lot of people fancy them, uh, and look, Cork haven't been stellar this year. They've kind of come good over the last couple of games, but. I mean, with Jack O'Connor in, in the form that he's in, and the bit of experience with Seamus Harnady, Harnady and, and Damian Cahalan alongside Horgan, like, I don't know, lads. Um, people are talking about the weather. It, there's like talk of maybe a bit of rain, which possibly might suit Limerick a bit more. Fergal Horgan is a referee that likes to, to let the game flow, which, again, maybe suits Limerick a bit more. But I just, uh, I just see this being a very tight one. I'm not going to call a draw. I think a draw is sitting on the fence a little bit much. But uh, mm. maybe Cork... Cork by a point I'm going to opt for. No draws in this year's quick picks as well, as uh, Will O'Callaghan knows to his detriment over the last little while. Winner mm. is how we're picking it. So even if it's after extra time and uh, Limerick win by your margin, you're getting the win. But with, like Will, just a couple of interesting ones over the next couple of days. There doesn't seem to be any consensus on what's going to happen with Shane Kingston. What, what do you think he, What do you think Kieran is going to do? Yeah, it's difficult because... You know, there's two arguments here, which is he comes on and shoots the lights out the last day. So has he earned the place to start within the forward line or is it better to keep him in reserve and bring him on? Or do you run the risk that if you keep Shane Kingston in reserve, that maybe you get into a losing position against Limerick in the game and it might be too late to bring him in? Like I thought he was excellent off the bench. Cork's um, subs just had a huge impact uh, in the last game when most of us expected with the way Kilkenny were going this year that it was actually going to be Brian Cody's subs that would win the game. And I certainly felt when that game went to extra time that I thought maybe Kilkenny are going to find an extra gear. Uh, but the kick was in Cork. And maybe a lot of that is down to their athleticism too, which is why they should be able to stick in with this game with Limerick right till the very end. It's not going to be you know, any kind of athletic issues that are going to catch up with them here. And like as Shane mentioned in terms of Patrick Corgan, he is the best hurler around who has not won in All-Ireland so far. And this year, he probably has a better supporting cast around him in the forward line. 2018, 2019, Horgan possibly had to carry too much of the scoring threat himself. Uh, while this time around, Cork have actually been chipping in in a better fashion. And he's had a really good year. Like, we remember back the score he got off his knees earlier this season. Like, that's what Patrick Horgan brings. He's not the most orthodox of player in terms of the shots that he takes on, but he is so good at shooting from anywhere. And Seamus Hickey was saying last night, he's one of the most difficult forwards in the country to mark because of his movement too. Like, he's happy enough to stay in around the full forward line for periods. Next thing he drifts out, you're not sure whether you should go out and chase him because he might be making space for somebody else. And if you foul anybody, Horgan is such a good free taker that he can punish them. I think the one thing is, though, lads, about Limerick is that they've had kind of that one real challenge, which was the Munster final this year, compared to getting caught a bit in the cold against Kilkenny. With the exception of a bad decision not to give the 65 at the end, they could have sent that game against Kilkenny to a replay. And similarly, they were able to come back when they had a little bit of extra time to do so against Tipperary this season. So even when Limerick have found themselves in positions of adversity over the last few years, generally they're able to come back. And I think even if Cork hit them for a couple of goals at the weekend, I would still fancy Limerick to wrestle back control. They're unlikely to be flustered. Um, you know where Dublin were flustered against Mayo last weekend? I don't think if we're making that comparison directly between Limerick and Dublin, I think even if Limerick get into a battle against Cork at the weekend and fall behind in the game, I don't expect Limerick to fluff their lines like Dublin did in the second half last week. No, like if we're making the Limerick and Dublin comparison, we're a few years away from talking about the decline of Limerick, uh, unfortunately for Cork. And although the one counterpoint to that, Will, is that if you'd made that argument last week that Dublin will get to the point where they were flustered, 
I just couldn't have seen that happening. That that was just so. That was how extraordinary last Saturday was. I, I was always of the, the belief, clearly wrongly, that you kind of needed to leave from the front and and, and you needed to uh, you needed to hammer them early because when it came to the championship minutes, Dublin would always come good. And they got worse when the pressure yeah. went on. Mayo got better. So any team can crumble, I guess. But while John Kiley and Canerk are in charge of this incredible bunch of players, I'm with you. I, I just can't see it happening. Yeah, like I couldn't believe it last week, lads. I, I really couldn't. Where we get to a point in the game where Dublin should have been seeing it out, and next thing they're taking risky hand passes in their half back line and full back line. This was like Conor Callan at one point spun and went backwards when he was on the halfway line. Now that had to be tactical instruction uh, for the players to try and hold possession and they not were push rattled. on. They were they, rattled, Will. They were yeah. rattled. Like McCart- when have you seen James McCarthy turned over two or three times? When have you seen Kieran Kilkenny turned over two or three times? And then I think. And that last play at the end of the game when Byrne and Comerford and Howard have the ball in the end line and they're being chased down by Karen O'Shea, the rest of the dubs are hiding. Yeah. Because they've, for the first time in their lives, they've been absolutely rattled and they have no, they have no get out of jail card. Like that's, that, that was it. Like it was incredible to watch. Oh, and do you mind if I jump in? I've just received yeah. a communicado official from Adrian Barry. I should have messaged him last night. He was drinking pints in his boffin, but he's up early. I said, uh, he called Mayo Unix last week. Anything for the people of Cork? He said, no, you've misrepresented my point. I did not say Mayo were Unix. I said there were varies. A very important point of difference. Varus is a Unix. Varus. If it, it is not a Unix that defines Varus, though, Adrian said. The Unix bit was having to operate without the two lads. Operating without the two lads, I believe he means Kieran O'Connor and Oshin Mullen. Mullen yeah. um, Varus is a great character. Okay. And anyways, Mayo aren't comparable to Cork. So I asked him for a message for the people of Cork and he said, it's been a great year, but you'll have to wait a few more. Oh, cutting <laughs> from Adrian Barry. I, I, I don't think that there is uh, there's anything I need to say to, to put a cherry on the cake or oh, that beat down from Adrian Barry. So you heard it here first. Limerick by eight points is what Adrian Barry is saying. You know where he is. You know how to get him if there is any sort of Cork versions of Kevin Kilban out there who are never going to forget about this for the rest of their lives, then Damien please get Delaney. in touch. Damien Delaney, there you go. Get in touch with that who's <laughs> Asian Barry and uh, sort out your problems. That's good luck this week. Uh, hopefully, good luck to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I need, I need a miracle at this stage. I need, I need to get these next two score scores bang on to actually not finish last, I think. So uh, we will see. But sure, look, this is all nonsense, this game anyway, and who actually cares about the winner at the end of the day? Will, Tommy, thanks a million. That is Cheers, it for this week's Quick Picks. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. Yeah, 8.52 on this uh, Friday morning on OTB AM with uh, myself and Owen. OTB AM brought to you, as always, by Gillette. Good mornings start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Now, we'll be bringing uh, you some more build-up from uh, Cork shortly on OTB AM. Uh, Owen live there, of course, uh, this morning, throughout the morning. But first... The Mayo senior football team got their All-Ireland final press day out of the way nice and early, nearly a month from the All-Ireland final. Tommy Rooney uh, caught up with uh, Stephen Cohen and James Horan in Castlebar yesterday. Uh, first, we want to hear from the Mayo manager, James Horan, on the reports that Aidan O'Shea was in a boot in the build-up to the Dublin game. The Aidan O'Shea substitution after 48 minutes was something that caught the eye in the middle of the game. It was reported that he was in a boot in the build-up to the final. Would that have had an impact on your decision at all? No, no. Um, look at it. You, you know, you you always go through things before a game and possible substitutions, and depending on certain scenarios happen. But every game is so so different. And look at we were chasing the game, and and we, we probably needed a couple more shooters in there. And you, you know, brought on James Caron, Darren Cohen, etc., who are who, who who can be very hot when they're. Therefore, so it was just a, a logical. Um, Logical, logical step at that stage in the game. Aiden isn't on the injury list over the next couple of weeks. No, look at it. They, they throw on those boots, those big boots, very, very frequently. I'm always at the medical team. We've we, we've a pile of them around the place all the time. But um, they obviously work for, for certain things. But but look, no, we've, um, we trained last night and and um, you know everyone's in good form. A few knocks and bangs for sure, but but uh, overall. Uh, I love the way they're getting the uh, the media days out uh, nice and early, just just in case, uh, and before they even know they're all out in final um, opposition as well. So loads of good stuff from from James Horn there and Aidan O'Shea. He also spoke James Horn about how we can temper expectations in Mayo over the next month. Plenty of build up. And uh, we know what the expectation level is like in Mayo. It's been a long time since they won that All-Ireland Senior Football Championship. Uh, But how will James Horn temper expectations uh, as the noise and the colour in the county ratchets up? 
expectations is always a big thing in every county going into an All Ireland final. But in Mayo, there's so much colour and excitement, and your fans love going on the journey to Crow Park. How are you going to manage that over the next three weeks, especially with such a young squad? Yeah, um, I, I, I was on a lecture yesterday about a, a guy that trains, uh, I think, the Gurkhas in the jungle. And I, I took a line from it that struck a chord with me, you know, that some of the key things were Gurkhas is, is spirit and fundamentals and basics or whatever. But the last one was, um, you know, because the operator is not to fight the jungle, um, to, to, to go with it to a certain certain extent. So so I think we'll, we we might adopt that, that that philosophy a little bit, is that, look, there's great, there's huge goodwill out there with, with, with the male public and... We, we we appreciate it. Um, we have our, our sessions and we our get-togethers and our Zoom calls where we it's a great point of reference for us as a team. So it's, look, I don't think there'll be, I don't think there'll be any problem uh, focusing the players. Uh, Owen, I don't know what your what your your thoughts are ahead of this this one. Like it's it's great to hear from Mayo nice and early, but um, it feels to me like a, a tactical thing getting all this uh, crap talk and media duties out of the way nice and early. Yeah, em- embrace the jungle. Actually, a really interesting nugget there from <laughs> from James Horn. I guess you've got no other option but to roll with it as as the country, the county rather, goes into a bit of a frenzy. They speak about the fact that this year has been so good to Mayo because people are living at home more, and um, people don't have to make these uh, training sessions in Athlone or be split up for half the year. I guess maybe one of the, the slight drawbacks of that now is that everybody is living at home when Mayo goes into All Ireland mode. Now, as we said at the top of the show, I actually haven't been in Mayo when they build up to an All-Ireland week, and I'm sure everybody knows to, to leave the players alone. And it, we are long past the days of players getting bothered for tickets or anything like that. But uh, maybe that's one thing you could cling to if you're looking for a reason why Mayo uh, might not um, might not perform to, to, their, to their own standards in the final. But that is very much clutching at straws. I think they're in a very good place. And part of that is actually getting the media dealings done early. Even the fact that they got it done early kind of shows that they know what they're doing. Like it, it, it was noticeable as well when Limerick kind of booked their place in the All Ireland final. They were out straight away. I think it might was maybe even the Monday, the, the, the following week, straight out, get the job done, and and go back into training. And you don't have to speak to anybody for a while. Mayo also know what it's like to, to build up to an All Ireland. They've done it plenty of times before, and, and they know how how to work these things. And, and James Horn knows how to work these things. So yeah, it does seem a little bit ridiculous when you can't ask them a question about Tyrone or Kerry, but uh, at the same time. What are you going to do? I think you get this thing done early and then you go into siege mentality mode. Yeah, probably probably a wise move. Get it out of the way um, and uh, dampen the build-up as much as best you can. Stephen Cohen as well uh, was at that uh, press day and Tommy spoke to him as well. He's an All-Ireland minor and under-21 winning captain, of course, for Mayo, but now has his role as a leader in this senior squad. Uh, changed over the past two years as James Horan managed the transition in the Mayo setup. So here's Stephen Cohen chatting to Tommy yesterday. In terms of leadership, as I mentioned, captain in 14, captain in 21, there's been a huge transition in, in Mayo football, never mind Dublin. There was a, a stat that we were throwing out in our football pod of Paddy and Andy over the summer that 80 All-Ireland medals had left the Dublin dress room this year. So a lot of experience. But by God, Mayo lost a lot of big big names over the last 18 months as well. How has your role within the dressing room changed? Because there's been a, a group of young lads that's come through now in the last year or two. How has your role changed since, we'll say, were you... Were you a, in your leaving cert when you first came into the Mayo senior yeah, panel? Yeah, um, I suppose, as you said there, Colin Boyle used to pick me up from school uh, when, when I was my first year in the panel and, and Michael Conroy. Um, but just the guys... What were those trips like? <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> Nothing to do with leaving cert, but I learned a lot on the way. But uh, look, uh, the guys who retired recently and in previous years, I mean, I've said it before, they always leave all the knowledge they have to you and, and just want you to bring it on further. There's no one there that has an ego or wants to... Uh, not for you to do well after them. They want you to make the jersey better and better and better. So, again, it's just a continuous cycle. And those guys like Andy, as you mentioned, David Clare, Chris Barrett, so many more key things, I haven't named them all. They've always left their, bin, their few nuggets and moved on. And it'll be the same every year that we go through. So, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, Stephen Cohen, of course, there, speaking to, uh, to Tommy at the Mayo Press Day yesterday. But let's forget about the big ball, Owen. It's all about the small ball this weekend. You've uh, you've been getting uh, engaging the um, I guess the feel in Cork and the build up to this one uh, and and speaking to to some more people ahead of uh, Sunday's game. Yeah, just a, a couple of quick pieces to bring you before we wrap up our Cork coverage. Just the last couple of days obviously has been uh, a, a massive sort of moment for for Cork in general because they know that they were going into to three big matches over the course of the next few days. The first one is done and dusted. They are under twenty. All-Ireland hurling champions and one of the members of their 
coaching team is, is Don Lomahney. He's an interesting guy to talk to uh, because of the fact that he's also working in the Christian Brothers School as well, which is responsible for so many of, uh, of the new hurlers in that team. And they seem to really have got their house in order. So uh, celebrations were well underway yesterday, but he kindly uh, met, met up before, uh, before he went celebrating. Have a look at this. OCB AM. First things first, Donald, congratulations. How have the last 24 hours been? Super. I'm sure every fellow uh, goes up dreaming with him on Ireland. It's been a fantastic 24 hours of this, I just suppose. It's still sinking really. And, you know, we're up more hope than expectation. In fact, we want to know it's still sinking so it's a sense of contentment today, I suppose. It's no surprise to people like you, I'd imagine, who've seen the development of Cork Hurling over the last few years. I suppose in the interviews they've been doing recently, I said a lot of it was about foundations. We were kind of, if you look at the houses, we were changed. The roof and the foundations need to be changed. The foundations, we were the schools. You know, the last number of years, I mean, Brother Christians, we've played the last two Hartley Cup finals. We've been CBS, one Hartley Cup final. Coleman has been Hartley Cup final. So we got the schools set up right. And because we're competing in the finals and semi finals, Hartley Cup, I think it's only a matter of time before that translated into minors and twenties, which thankfully is the new issue. That seems to be the bedrock of any good. GA County at the moment, doesn't it? The school system really is the, the key part of the foundation. Absolutely, I suppose uh, St. Cairns are synonymous with Kenny, yeah. back one, and Kenny, the delivery, we were top dogs at the moment, it's in your league. They're back one by two or three very good odds called Russian teams uh, winning the Hartley Cup, uh, and that's the platform for us then that we looked at that as well in our place, and we said that we need to get the Hartley Cup right. Uh, and we have, and we've got a good geographical spread around across Cork, and we can see the East Cork, and uh, see Holmes and Norcock, and ourselves Christians in the city, so. Um, there's good hurlers going to schools playing at the top level the transition from that to the front level is that easier. Mm. The similarity with Arts School Reach as well is that Christians could be seen as a rugby school by a lot of people as, yeah. as Arts School would be as well. So was that a challenge at all? Massive, yeah. Uh, we're a rugby school and we have been for over 100 years. So it was a, a brave decision by the uh, principal at the time, Dr Larry Jordan, to come into hurling. Uh, we were based in the middle of the city and I think he was looking at it. And past people were fine first and when I was was fine first. It's uh, not one of the main Hartley Cup schools in Cork City. I was in the well in Hartley Cup. Uh, fine first is closed at the moment. Not one still a very good hurling school. But uh, we just felt it was a niche in the matter for a hurling school in the city. There were hurling families. There's great hurling families in Cork and send their kids. Uh, and because we played the academics, the so regular Christians was there, a good fit. Thankfully, that's the that's good profession now that you've uh, really good at spurring young hurlers inside the city are coming to us because they want to play hard to go hurling because they see that the power to go hurling. Do you think the senior success so far this year is as a result of that as well, or do you think that the work you've done will actually take a couple of more years to see the results of that senior level? I think both, well, to be fair, like there's a, a, a couple of tensions. The clubs have been massive work, there's some fantastic coaching on our rage. We have low for a second, an awful lot of credit. Uh, the event there a couple of years ago, you know, for a couple of club the man is very much involved in that as well, and uh, a lot of strategic thinking we their planning. And that has developed really well as well. And definitely the schools have a massive contribution to success. The question is it too early? Um, I don't know, we'll see after Sunday. Yeah, that's the Cork Under 20 boss, Donald Mahoney, chatting to your cell phone. Yes, indeed. And uh, just apologies about the sound quality on that. But we are going back indoors next to the nice, uh, warm sounds of Johnny Hayes. Now, Johnny Hayes is uh, somebody who Colin Buhig, our uh, colleague here in Off the Ball, recommended to me. He's uh, somebody his father would have known quite well. And uh, in the Black Rock area uh, of Cork, Johnny Hayes is known as uh, the doyen almost of of great former Cork teams and obviously uh, played to an extremely high level himself. But when it comes to the Cork teams, when it comes to the makeup of those clubs, uh, his knowledge is second to none. So uh, we spoke for a while, but here's the section where we spoke about the great Christy Ring. He, he, had, he had the skill to burden. Nice. Uh, Ring had the skill to burden to, to, um, to beat players. And they had to be... It mustn't be as fast, but he was, he was the valley dancer. He was, he could sidestep and he could do this and he could do that. I mean, he 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 scored them uh, fantastic scores. I mean, well, he was on his ninth medal in '56, and and uh, and you know there was only a puck of the ball with him in the end, and uh, they shouldered him off the field at the the Nick O'Donnell and and. Uh, Record and I think Neville was there. Was there no Tom Neville on that team? Um, they brought back uh, they brought back Ned Wheeler to left half back that time to to Cork Cork Hill the Cork half forward. Like, 
You were there in Croke Park that day in '56. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I was in there, and uh, um, I was in, I was in the stand for for '56. Uh, my father got me a ticket. He was, my father was going to hold the match as hard as life. He was, as far as I know, he was at the thirty-one final. And my father was born in eighteen. 1899, the last day of the century, and he went to the 31, and he told me that he was he was at the Tunnel the Lightning final, the 1939 final, and uh, you know that that's, that was all, that was that was people's lives all all down through the years, and I'm I'm the same. I'm still I'm going to Crow Park since '53, and if I went every year now, I'd be I'd be going 68 years to Crow Park. And I tend to go on a Sunday and <laughs> hoping for a win. It, it's amazing, isn't it, how um, Cork hurling is intertwined with all these legendary moments. Like you mentioned the Thunder and Lightning final there that everybody's heard about, the 56 one that you were at. Yeah, and the 31 one, that, that was three. It was three. What in, happened 31? 31. Uh, it was a draw twice and Cork won the replay and Laurie Marr was off in the final. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, Odie Collin was the captain. The man in that photograph there. What's the best Cork game you've ever been at? The one you enjoyed the most or the one that had you on the edge of your seat the most? Well, it was, it was very, very hard to pick one. I, suppose, I mean, I was only, I was young in, in, in 56 when we got the three goals. Mm. I, I, I mean, the Limerick crowd were roaring and shouting that they had the match one, and my God, to see them three goals going in, it was, it was, it was unreal. This was the Munster final in 1956? That was the Munster final in 56 against Limerick. And the ring was held scoreless for, for, for 50, nearly 50 minutes. But he won the game, and he won the game. You, you never have a won until the final whistle. We know that in every sport. So he scored three goals in the last 20 minutes? Three goals right. in the last 10 minutes. 10 minutes, sorry, yes, yeah, yeah. Three goals, Three goals in the point, I think he got. Yeah. And what happened? What, what did he change? Did he just decide to... Take it seriously. Well, 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 Ringham would come out from the corner and and he'd come out uh, between the centre back and the, the centre forward and you know if he got a, if he got a sniff as they got a, if he got a sniff of the ball and if he got on the sore run you wouldn't stop him. I mean he was he he wasn't a big man over he was he was he had he had fierce speed and and skill you know. I mean, you had, uh, I had a photograph there now of him of, uh, in the 56 final. Jim Brown was one of the best cornerbacks that was played. And he, uh, he, he sights at the Rome's on the ground and ring was gone, but Perry Philfat was covering him. You know, so, you know, they're, they're the things that count in, 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 in every sport. Uh, covering people got getting cut out, you know. It was like Cork were caught with the goal against uh, Kilkenny. And, I mean, the two, the two best cornerbacks we had for years are the two cornerbacks, and one of them was caught. But, look, we'll take it. We're in the final. Great memories there, Owen. Uh, what a memory as well he's got. Like, going to Crook Park, as he said, for 60-odd years, Johnny Hayes, what an incredible man. Yeah, and uh, an unbelievable collection of photos as well. A really high quality photos of, of Christy Ring as well, which uh, never really seen before. And even in, in some of the photographs where he's in his civvies, it's actually hard to recognize him where it's like, oh, is that actually what he looks like? Because it's like you just recognize the man and the, the great photos of him in his cork gear and all that. So, uh, yeah, no, that was that was an interesting chat. There was uh, a, a couple of different pieces there that that, that, that you could have done um, considering his, his knowledge was, was so wide and, and so in depth. But uh, that is uh, Johnny talking about uh, Christy Ring and about those games in the 1950s in particular, which is just a, a brilliant era for hurling. The, the next thing I want to bring you this morning is uh, another piece I did out in Kill Britain. So before I cut up with uh, Jamie Wall, he advised me to to go down the road and speak to a guy uh, called Francie O'Brien. And uh, Francie is somebody who's been involved with Kill Britain uh, for a long, long time as well and had some incredible stories to tell. The, the piece I want to play this morning is about the connection between the GAA and uh, republicanism in, in West Cork during the War of Independence in particular. Here he is talking about that. It was like a religion, really, in my father's time, right? That if you joined 
I mean, that is playing Callum, no, there's a, there's a village outside in the air, really. And they used to be training up the fields and here in this place. For about a year and a half, like, and not all the time, but like, I mean, that I'd come out and Liam Deasy and those of us, and they'd give them a week special training, like. But they hadn't enough rifles to go around, like. So when if they had a huddle, they trained with huddles, like. And huddle became a small guard, like. And then when the serious stuff started in 1919, every holly was dumped and buried, like, under veils. Well, there were no veils, they didn't go under reeks of hay and so on. And because if the tents raised and they raided here several times, if the tents raised it here, they cut a holly, they'd crack it and burn it in the fire. And, 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 like, when the whole thing was all over, then, like, when they got a chance to go back playing hodling again, like, they thought, uh, a lot of them thought that football was an extract of, of British rule in Ireland, you know what I mean? The soccer and, and the rugby and all that, that was like a, a round ball. With a, they, because the English didn't understand how many that, you know what I mean? They really didn't, like, and, and they thought that was a Muggs game, like, but, but they knew that, that the backbone of, of huddling and GA was with the fellows that were out the time of trouble, they got the run and everything, but, but they all took to the huddling, they went the huddling, when the when the truce was fine and they all went back huddling again. And that made huddling huddling was like a religion when I was growing up, like in Kilwritten even though and didn't that you you'd be winning matches like. But if you if you got you know, it's different you know, young fellows with television you know, doing their own thing and I, I see young fellows in Kilwritten now that should be playing you know, gave it up when they were only fourteen or fifteen, like, and got interested in something else, driving cars or something like that, you no. Know, like. But when I was there, like when I was growing up there in the 40s, the 50s, there was no, no casual. I used to cycle the Timber League two nights a week, even that we had a pitch in Gilbertin Lake. Mm. And we used to train on a weeknight and a Sunday Lake. But there was five good hodlers playing, and over by Timber League, they were playing for Gilbertin, five of Helen Brothers. And I used to cycle over to their field at the back of the house two nights a week, just to, to let them something off of them. Like, you'd be that involved, you know what I mean? Because my father was a good hodler. Like, he had, he had seven county uh, Westcott medals we could written and one of eight Westcott medals. I have them there, so I'm going to show them to you later on. And one, he had one of them in Journal Football. They won the Journal Football as well. But Hobbling was the god, like, you know. And that and, was because of the fact that they had to hide their Hurleys. Yeah, they had to... and that was, that, was, that, was, that was because of the, the you know, the kind of, I suppose, speech you call it, yeah. about the British fellas, like, you know, because a lot of them, I, I've seen photographs, we have an album, album somewhere where, where, where my father and fellas his age, and when they were in their 20s, they were all young men, like 22 or 3, like, they were drilling at the field up there at the top of the hill above the cross there. There was about 20 of them drilling, and, and this, they, they'd only a couple of guns between them, like, and Tommy Barry would give them a gun, like he'd give you a gun now for a drill, and he'd tell you how to do it. And, and the rest of them would have to do the same thing with the hodlies, you know, present the arms and all this kind of thing. And then he, he, he'd pass the gun around, everyone would get a go at the gun, like, but they'd only throw three guns, like. Right. Fascinating stuff from uh, from Francie O'Brien there. Like, it's, it's almost like a history lesson. Like, I know Tom Barry's a fairly iconic figure down in those parts. Born in, born in Kerry as well, a Kilorglin man, but uh, definitely a revered figure down in Cork. Um, and you've been finding out about Corkness and what that means as well, Owen. Yeah. I, I certainly have. Uh, this is something that's, uh, I guess, been in the vernacular for, for quite some time and was kind of pushed into the public consciousness a little bit more when uh, the county board were embraced the idea of Corkness in a review and about what they hope to achieve in the future. And I kind of like that. I kind of think that for the, the future of Cork herders and footballers, it's about embracing that level of confidence that that should be connected to Cork at all times. So everybody I spoke to over the last little while, I threw in a question at the end, uh, what is Corkness? And uh, here's what they all said. We've got some varying degrees of answers. The phrase Corkness gets used a lot and it's been coined over the last little while. There's a loose definition. Everybody's got a different definition. What's your definition of Corkness, if I had to ask you? Um, not afraid to, to go against the grain. Um, a willingness to, to offer an opinion and... Um, even if it's not a popular one, um, and that's was that's where the term the the, the rebel county comes from, um, and we've had some great uh, <laughs> some great men that have offered 
uh, opinion, but a willingness to stand out and not afraid to be to, to be different. Corkness means so like we're just proud of where we're from. Like there's a great tradition, Roy Keane, Sanyo Sullivan, Christy Ring, Mick Barry, like of, of sport, there's a sporting tradition in Cork and 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 we we're, we're proud of where we're from. Like wherever we go in the world, we, we know we're from Cork and we whatever we do, whether it be in business, uh, in our professional life, uh, in everything we do, we put our heart and soul into it. And there's a kind of a Cork pride and confidence uh, that we go out and do everything to the best ability. And we have a, tr a, a history of success. And that success is going to continue Sunday on. I know it is. What would I like it to be or what? Yeah, go, go aspirational if you want. Aspirational. Go aspirational. Yeah, yeah, go I think it's a kind of a, a sense of kind of defiance or something, you know, like it's that kind of Roy Keane, small young fella who didn't get a chance and kept getting kicked and kept getting kicked, but was like, I'm going to make it at 23. You know, how many, how many fellas make it in the Premier League at that age? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's like, I'm going to go to Harvey, I'm going to go to Cove Ramblers, I'm going to go to Nottingham Forest, and then I'm going to fucking make it at Man United. I'm going to be the best player that ever played for Ireland, yeah. or the best Irish player ever. That would be my opinion. Like, that's what I would like it to be. It's that kind of, you can keep kicking me as much as you want, but I believe I'm good enough, like, because, you know, the one about the Cork man with the inferiority complex, yeah. <laughs> only thought he was as good as everyone else. Yeah, like, yeah. it's, it, but it's, but it's, it's not a, like, well, what I want it to be is, it's not a false confidence, it's not a cockiness. Yeah. It's a confidence, Do you know, it's an actual, like, I'm, I'm going to be better than you because I'm going to work harder at it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, not, I'm better than you just because I am. Sure. And I think, and like, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that attitude. And if yeah. that's your attitude, like, that's, I would say that's possibly carriness as well. Yeah. When it comes to football, you know, yeah. it's, we are going to be better than you, but we're also going to work fucking harder than you at it. That's why we're going to be better than you. Yeah. And then we're going to be better than you, like, you know? And um, that's, that's what I'd like it to be anyway. Uh, I think Cork is a number of things I think number one it, we have a genuine passion for what we do and we put our heart and soul into everything that we do um, I, I think number two uh, Corkness stands for community you know um, everyone rolls around everyone and you can see that in the spirit of Cork Harling at the moment um, and number three you know I think it's just soul spirit and you know momentum that we put our hearts and souls behind everything so Corkness no Corkness, Corkness. Not cockiness. She's not. There's nothing. No question. <laughs> I, I thought you were saying cock or cocky or something. Yeah. No. Um, cockiness. What can you say? For cockiness, for me, like it's colours and banter and you know, like it's baldness regalia and all that. Like that's what cockiness means to me. You know. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Yeah, I love the love the confusion there, Owen, between cockiness and cockiness. There's a it's a very grey line, I think, between the two sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think that the, uh, the the cockiness only comes as a result, maybe, of success. So, so maybe the, the cockiness and corkiness will come back over the next little while if if this young hurling team actually does turn out to be one of the great teams that the county has produced. But yeah, I, I, I think uh, Jimmy Wall put it nicely actually there, saying that uh, we can be better than you if we work harder than you, and that that, that ability to, to go the extra mile is. Is, is probably a good mantra for any team, let alone Cork. And I think really the, the messages around Gaelic games at the moment, even listen to James Horne there actually, are about humility and, and about the, the team ethic. And it's what underpinned the great Dublin team and it's what is currently underpinning the great Limerick team. And I would be astonished if that is not the same message that the Cork hurlers are currently taking on board and the footballers for that matter, across all ages and men's and women's as well. So maybe Corkness changes a little bit because Gaelic Games, I think, has, has maybe changed a little bit too. Yeah, for sure. Roy Keane, not a bad example for, for Jamie Wall to use as an example of the epitome of Corkness uh, as well. Listen, Owen, great stuff from Cork this morning, great stuff from Limerick yesterday and uh, enjoy the match on Sunday. Cheers, Shane. Enjoy the weekend. Nice one, Owen Sheehan there, of course, from Cork, live with you this morning. Uh, we've got loads still to come on OTB Sports Radio, uh, the schedule across uh, the day as well. From half past one, we've got the Paddy Power half hour back, as always, uh, during the Premier League season. And there's some really good games to look forward to across this weekend. From three o'clock, we are live with Friday Night Racing, as uh, we are every single Friday afternoon. From 4pm, it's the Team 33 Legends interview with Brian Dean. 
of course, uh, the first ever goal scorer in the Premier League back with uh, Sheffield United and spent some time with Leeds United and plenty of other clubs as well. Uh, so really interesting stuff from him from four o'clock on OTB Sports Radio. From 6 p.m., it's an OTB Gold interview with Mayo legend Cora Staunton. And uh, of course, we're live from 7 p.m. this evening uh, on Off the Ball. Uh, loads of great stuff to come uh, with the lads this evening from 7 o'clock on Newstalk Radio and on OTB Sports Radio. More importantly, we're bringing you uh, John Giles before 10 a.m. this morning. He was on uh, with Will last night. And we're back after these talking the Premier League with Phil Egan. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Football is back. The Premier League on OTB. Ball to Sterling! Raheem Sterling! Exclusive Premier League live commentaries every Sunday. The very best expert analysis on your phone and for free. Download the OTB Sports app now. He's a seven-time All-Ireland winner. He's a Mayo legend. Now they're together on the same team. Join Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran for the hit of the GEA season. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. Nine months, you're a monk. If that goes well, well then you have October, November, December, <laughs> and you enjoy it, and you Lord Prince of, of Copperface Jacks. Get the hop on everyone else. Hear the Football Pod and more first on the OTB Sports app every Tuesday morning. For the latest on GAA, Olympics, rugby, football and more, download the OTB Sports app, turn on push notifications, and hear it here first. OTB AM With Gillette Put your best face forward With our new and improved razors Yeah, it's 20 past 9 On this Friday morning Here on OTB AM And it's time to say A very good morning To our own Phil Egan Morning Phil Hey Shane, how are you doing? Keeping well, keeping well We've been uh, hurling out of it uh, This morning Loads of great stuff from Owen But um, I know you were watching as I, as I was as well Shamrock Rovers Against Flora Tallinn Last night And in the Europa League Conference Playoff first leg um, Like 3-2 would have been bearable, but I feel like that fourth goal was was a real killer for Shamrock Rovers. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think the way they conceded the four goals in general was was really bad. Um, you know, you're looking at... I know Stephen Bradley had talked before the game about Flora Tallinn and they were probably a, a tougher proposition than uh, Slovan Bratislava, which I didn't necessarily agree with, but I just Rovers were so open. And the fact that they got it back to 3-2, you thought, right, just close up shop and set things up lovely for Tallah Stadium next Thursday when you're going to have three and a half thousand fans behind you and you know you, you've got to look at them and you can you can analyse how Flora play and it's definitely doable 4-2 is still doable but to win the game to win the tie Rovers have to score three goals more than, than Flora Tallinn or else I mean they can get two and they go to extra time and penalties but yeah it, they're very much up against it so it was a disappointing performance Yeah like and nearly 3 million euro available for the winners so we know what's at stake even financially for, for Shamrock Rovers as well like when that Liam Scales header goes in um, and that they reduce the deficit to one with, with four minutes left it's like you said I think Dan McDonald called it a horror show on, on, on Twitter last night like it, it's it's the nature of, of the goal Shamrock Rovers conceded defensively a mess at times yeah and Stephen Bradley said it after the game he just was baffled by the the way they conceded the goals he was like we don't concede goals like that and uh, yeah it was just really really poor and I think even just when Graham Burke got the goal before half time, he thought, right, that's going to settle them down because there was a little spell where uh, Dylan Watts had a chance just before that and forced a good save out of the keeper. And you could see Rovers were getting on top. And when Graham Burke was brilliant finish considering the amount of traffic in front of him, and you thought that's going to settle them down. But the same mistakes were being made. There was too much space in midfield. Obviously, uh, Lee Grace was a big loss for Rovers in, in the in defence and the, the formation that they played. You know, you've got Watts and O'Neill in central midfield, two very good midfielders. But at times, he just felt that Rovers just the the shape that they were in, that they were leaving themselves too exposed. And obviously, if you play three at the back, your wing backs are going to be pushed on, and then two of those centre halves can get pulled out into wide areas which they don't necessarily want to be and yeah I, in fairness to Flora Tallon they, they were quite clinical they had a few chances in the second half that brilliant save from Manus and then they had a chance where they, they blazed one over so they, but other than that they were very clinical so it, I, I still think I do fancy Rovers to win the second leg whether they can do enough to actually get through but if they don't get through, it's going to be a missed opportunity because, as you said, they've already accumulated one and a half million euro 
win that and they go shy of just under three million and obviously then there's bonuses for winning games in the group stage but also as well it's just you know the the allure of getting to the the group stage of european competition something they they managed to do 10 years ago in the europa league and i think a lot of people would have fancied rovers before the first leg last night to go through so they've given themselves plenty of work to do but um yeah i, I think it's going to make for a really good game next thursday like, and I remember Stephen Bradley talking in, in advance of, of last night's game about how Flora were, were probably better than that Slovan Bratislava team that, that knocked Rovers out of the Champions League. And like on last night's evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, on last night's evidence, it's probably hard to disagree. Like so many Estonian internationals as well in that team. And sometimes when a team has a rake of international players in their ranks, you can tell. I mean, they punish you. They punish mistakes. And they did punish all of Shamrock Rovers' mistakes last night. Yeah, and that, that's the difference where Rovers don't concede goals like that in the League of Ireland and you're stepping up in quality. But I still think Rovers have enough quality in their squad and their starting eleven that they, they should have been beating Flora Tallinn or at least maybe coming away from the the, the, the first leg with a draw and set things up for, for next week. But as I said, let's see what Flora Tallinn are made of next week where they, they have to come over here and... You know, it'll. I'm not saying it's going to be hostile, but look, it's going to be a home support partisan crowd, and the the key is obviously the first goal. And you know, what do you do? How do you approach it? Do you try and keep it tight and just play it in in spells where you think right? If we can go in at half time, a goal up, and then we have another half to try and get another goal, and worst case scenario, we're getting extra time. But yeah, if Flora Talon score first, then you know it just becomes not mission impossible, but very tough. I uh, wanted to touch on the Premier League as well. Uh, Phil, this morning ahead of uh, the weekend's action, um, Arsenal-Chelsea is the live game here and off the ball on, on Sunday afternoon, half past four. Brian Kerr alongside Stephen Doyle and commentary uh, for that one. Um, and certainly mixed fortunes for the two of them. Uh, on the opening day of the season last weekend, Arsenal had the, I wouldn't call it a horror show, but uh, certainly a defeat to Brentford is not the ideal way for Mikel Arteta to start the season. Um, and for Chelsea, I mean, really, really good stuff from them. A 3-0 win over over Norwich and uh, impressive as well like it's hard to see Arsenal get anything out of this game would, would, would you be thinking along the same lines yeah I mean you think back to last season Arsenal beat Chelsea twice in the league now the difference is I, I wonder what Arsenal are they one of the clubs that probably benefited more from having no fans in the ground because this game is obviously at the Emirates we know obviously it's the it's the first game home game of the season and you're coming off the back of a, a 2-0 defeat to Brentford obviously Chelsea have beaten Crystal Palace comfortably Lukaku is in line to start um, and you just wonder if, if Chelsea were to score first what that would do for the atmosphere at the Emirates because there's probably a lot of very frustrated Arsenal fans that are going to be in the ground on Sunday where they're looking at how the club has run um, We obviously Aubameyang and Lacazette missed last week due to Covid now it, w it was only the first game of the season there were a few signs that Arsenal are going to have the same problems where you just look at the, the squad and th physically they're not tough enough uh, mentally at times they're not tough enough they've no leaders I just think even the second goal they conceded sure Bernd Leno has been fouled let's like it, you know it, it was quite clear he's been fouled but what you want to see there is you want to see either Leno or players Arsenal players around saying to the officials are you going to check that because that's ridiculous Pontus Janssen is holding him and he's like got his arm around them and at least force them into having a look and consider is this a goal that we have to disallow but Arsenal are just too nice now they they had some joy against Chelsea last season where they pressed them they, they basically said as soon as you play that first ball into midfield we're going to crowd you and Jorginho was forced into mis a mistake last season in the game at Stamford Bridge and they'll try and do the same but w they just don't have the same quality that Chelsea do obviously Chelsea have Lukaku to come in and that's a frightening prospect of Lukaku running at that Arsenal defence because Ivan Tony and Brian Mbumo did a very good job on them last week where they were physical with them and Arsenal didn't like it yeah, for sure. Romelu Lukaku's an interesting one. I was checking the predictions, OTB predictions there for the season. Both myself and yourself went for uh, Romelu Lukaku, as did plenty of others uh, for, for a top goal scorer this season. So it'll be really interesting to see what he brings to that uh, Chelsea lineup. A trim looking uh, Romelu Lukaku, it has to be said as well. Um, 
Liverpool as well in action. Uh, I think it's the early kickoff on Saturday against Burnley. Phil, like this week, we had we had Kevin Caban writing them off. We had John Giles talking them up. Where where are you at on, on Liverpool at the moment? Yeah, I, I think you could argue Liverpool have a better squad now or even a better starting eleven than they had when they won the league a couple of seasons ago. But the problem is, and I can see why, I mean, the, it was going around during the week that uh, before the start of the season, the, the whole BBC team of pundits had to pick their, their top four and not one of them went for Liverpool. And that irked a lot of Liverpool fans. I don't think it's that they think Liverpool are a bad team, but say two seasons ago, since then, obviously Chelsea have got better. City have got better and obviously Manchester United have got better and there is that worry that if Liverpool pick up a few injuries like they did last season have they got the depth and I don't think they have the depth But so you're basically going into a season thinking if Liverpool can stay relatively healthy in terms of injuries then of course they can win the league Van Dijk coming back is a massive obviously uh, like it's such a big boost for, for Liverpool not only is he the best defender in the Premier League but his distribution even watching him last week he's pinging balls out to each wing you think of he has the ability to hit a 60 yard pass think back to the Champions League winning season the away leg against Bayern Munich Sadio Mane's goal Van Dijk pings a ball 60 yards now Mane still has a lot to do but the fact that he has that in his locker, Liverpool didn't have that last season. And teams then are thinking, let's just go push up on Liverpool, force them into mistakes. Now they're a little bit caught in between where they don't want to leave their defence one-on-one with Liverpool because Van Dijk could just ping a ball over the press. And then, and, that, and that's what he gives you. And obviously, because he's a centre-half as well, he's coming back from a cruciate injury. It's not as if he's a combative midfielder where you'd be worried about him going into a load of challenges he can just work his way back to full fitness and it's rare you see Van Dijk having to go full tilt because he's just that good. Now tomorrow is a good test for him in terms of balls being thrown into the box by Burnley and you know the physicality of it. So it'll be a tough test for them. Burnley have actually done well in their last couple of visits to Anfield. Obviously they were the team that ended that unbeaten run and they, they drew with them the, the season before. The only team to, to get something at Anfield that season. So Burnley do love playing a game at Anfield but I think the fact that it's the first home game of the season full house even though it's a half 12 kickoff sometimes it can take Liverpool a while to wake up but I think they'll be they'll be ready for for Burnley tomorrow uh, just briefly Phil then uh, Manchester United uh, very impressive in their opening uh, win over Leeds United I know you went for for United to finish fourth in the Premier League this season that was before of course that game last weekend but uh, where are you at on them at the moment? I, I suppose they have to keep their feet on the ground. It's only it's only one game into the season, but the squad looks a lot better than it did last season. The, the additions of Varane and Sancho are huge. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, it's so important to hit the ground running because United did quite the opposite last season. They obviously lost to Palace and they were obviously starting a week later than everyone because of the the uh, European involvement. So, um, yeah, they. I, I think we United obviously one thing that stood out last week was they looked fit and strong and Solskjaer said it after where well, that was the problem last season that they you know they were sleepwalking into the season so you got to hit the ground running they've nice fixtures they've obviously got Southampton on Sunday away and we know how good United were away from home they you know they don't really have any of the, they don't really have to play any of the big teams till late October now they've got a tough run around then where they'll be playing the likes of Liverpool Chelsea and City in the space of a few games but between now and then they've a chance to get some points on the board and um, we obviously saw how good Pogba was I think Leeds was a good game for them because Leeds obviously go one on one at times and it suited United perfectly and the, the reason I, I, I went for them to finish fourth it's not that I don't think United are a good team I just think that there are better teams than them and I suppose we're going to see when the Champions League starts and they start having to make changes what are they going to be like also as well think back to Bruno Fernandes the hat-trick goal last week Lindelof plays a ball in teams are not going to give United that amount of space Leeds did and they did the same at Old Trafford last season but we know what United are like when teams sit in against them have they got the the creativity to break them down. Now, they obviously, if, if Pogba's like that and, and Bruno Fernandes is like that and Mason Greenwood is finishing and you bring in Sancho, of course they're going to hurt teams. But it's about getting that consistency. And I would just wonder, that central midfield position still just it would be my, my slight concern there as well. People think maybe with Varane coming in, they can push up a bit. 
but you're still a few question marks is, is David De Gea your number one or Dean Henderson it's it's amazing I think how people have talked up Dean Henderson as if he's one of the best goalkeepers in the world he's still very much raw and I don't know yet if he's good enough to be the United number one yeah some real decisions to be made by uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer there some, some cracking games to look forward to this weekend listen Phil great stuff as always enjoy the football this weekend will do cheers thanks Shane our own Phil Egan there of course as always here on OTB AM brought to you by Gillette Good mornings. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Loads to come across the weekend here on Off the Ball as well. It's starting from uh, 7 p.m. this evening uh, on tonight's show, Friday Night Racing with jockey David Egan. We've got a weekend football preview as well with uh, Johnny Ward and a manager's perspective on All Ireland hurling final day. Cyril Farrell and Liam Griffin will be on the show tonight. So, really, really good stuff there. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday, we're on air from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Uh, John Duggan in the hot seat. We'll have a Saturday panel All Ireland hurling final preview. Uh, Kieran Carey and Tomas Mulcahy will be among uh, our guests on that one. And then OTB Football Saturday from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, following all the weekend's Premier League action. David Myler, Dan McDonald, and Johnny Ward uh, with John Duggan for that one. And on air from 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, it's uh, Tommy Welch with updates all the way from the All Ireland hurling final at Croke Park between Cork and Limerick. Uh, Vincent Hogan and Sarah O'Donovan will also join us for build up ahead of that game. The paper review as well, as always, Paul Rice will be among our guests on that one. Should be a cracker. And then, of course, live Premier League commentary as well from half past four. It's Arsenal against Chelsea. Brian Kerr uh, alongside Stephen Doyle for commentary duty for that one. If you've missed anything from OTB AM this week, you will catch it, as always, all back on the OTB AM podcast. Just search for OTB AM wherever you listen to your podcasts. You'll get our Cork special from today. Thursday's show live from Limerick as well and everything else from the week. We'll leave you now, uh, between now and 10 o'clock, with uh, John Giles. He was in conversation last night with Will O'Callaghan. Enjoy. You're very welcome back to Off the Ball. It is time for us to chat football with John Giles. John, how are you getting on? I'm good, Will. Yourself? I'm good. You were watching Shamrock Rovers like ourselves over the last couple of hours. We were just chatting on the news round that it would have been a very different complexion if the game had blown up a couple of minutes earlier, John, and they got away with a one-goal defeat. But that fourth goal could prove crucial in the tie. Was yeah, definitely at that particular stage, Will. Uh, you, you, you're getting away with it a little bit with the one goal, but to lose 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 the one near the end like that could be really, really important when, when they come to Dublin. When it comes to midfield, John, it's so important to win midfield in games. We just noticed Shamrock Rovers were overrun in midfield a few times and that fourth goal summed it up too that you know, when they got caught on the break there seemed to be very few numbers back in midfield all night there seemed to be a bit of a struggle Talon were on top middle of the park yeah well but they had good more chances than Rovers did as well you know that you have to say they deserved to win the game uh, but I think it was it was a poor poor, poor, for, poor show for Rovers to lose four goals uh, Will, on a match on a match like that yeah, real disappointment. It makes it very difficult for Tala does, next week. Yeah, it does, definitely. The high point maybe of the game, other than Scales getting up and getting the goal, it's no great surprise there's so much interest in him from the UK given how well he can defend and how well he can get forward. But Graham Burke's finish for the first Shamrock Rovers goal, that was a hell of a hit, John. Yeah, it was a good hit. He knew exactly what he was doing, didn't he? Pulled it onto his left foot and got a good uh, a good strike at it. So the goals generally in the match were good. Well, I mean, that's not, that's not very good for Shamrock Rovers. But overall, I mean, the, 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 the standard of play was good. Mm. Manus may be a bit too busy from Shamrock Rovers' perspective. A lot to do for them uh, next week yes, to try and definitely. come back from, from yeah. two goals down. Another couple of your former teams kicked off uh, the Saturday action in the Premier League last weekend, John. Manchester United against Leeds. And sometimes we question the way Marcelo Bielsa sets up his Leeds teams. Uh, a lot of space was left for Manchester United the weekend, which Bruno Fernandes and Mason Greenwood and Paul Pogba were more than happy to go in behind Leeds many times during the game. Ah, yeah, Leeds, Leeds, uh, Leeds weren't at it at all, really. Uh, well, you know, Manchester United played extremely well and beat them well. You know, you, you'll find with Leeds, they're not, they're not going to play defensively. Um, and sometimes sometimes that works for them very, very well if they're getting the attacking players going. Uh, and sometimes it can be bad. And it was, it was a bad one last weekend for them, there's no doubt. United took the chance as well. Uh, on the day well deserved to win it well deserved yeah they enjoyed that space that was left behind and in this case Paul Pogba and people will wonder what's going to happen with his contract and whether he'll extend to say beyond next summer 
but he laid on four goals for his teammates last weekend. Could have had a goal himself uh, with the good chance he had when he got in behind mm. two. This was a really good Paul Pogba performance to start the new season. Well, it's, it's what Pogba, 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 can, Pogba, Pogba sorry, can do. Uh, well, he can he can do certain very, very talented lad. What he, would, he did, and, and he did very some very, very talented things in the match uh, last weekend. Um, and but I think what you need from him is is is, is standard uh, every week. Not 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 creating those goals all the time, but playing to playing for the team, uh, doing his stuff when they don't have the ball, and that and uh, that's when you when when the real player is there. I mean, was, he was good last week, and he's got he's got tremendous talent. There's no doubt about it. But uh, you know, I always think, well, he puts himself first before the team. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Uh, but last weekend, I think it was made for him, and the Leeds didn't didn't play well. Fernandez, uh, well, all the um, United players took the goals really well, really well. They were they were well on top, and, and uh, Pogba certainly did his stuff on the day. Well, Manchester United have boosted their squad substantially with Rafa Varane coming in. He was presented before the game. You know, the fans got to see a bit of Jadon Sancho coming off the bench. Two big signings there for big money. Uh, they'll eventually get Rashford back from injury and maybe the break will do him no harm given the amount of football he's played over the last couple of years. Mm. Midfield was ticking along nicely this weekend. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was pretty bullish about their chances after the game, John. He was talking about United being back. Yeah, well, yeah. he said it was the real, this is the real United. Uh, I thought I thought the, the the comments after the match from Rio Ferdinand and and particularly Solskjaer were, were, was was exaggerated to say the least. This is the first match of the season, you know. You, I think you should be talking like that when it comes like two or three matches to the end of the season. Long, long, long way to go. And I wouldn't uh, one thing in football you should never get carried away, as they say. Never get too high, never get too low. When you're beaten, never get too low. But certainly don't get too high when you're beaten. And that seemed to be the case for me. I, I thought they were getting carried away with it a little bit. It was a good win. It was a good start to the season. But it's the first match. Do we have to change our expectations about Manchester United a little bit, John, given the work they've done in the transfer market? Because if Iran comes in and settles and plays at his Real Madrid level and adds pace into the centre of that defence, it'll help out Maguire. Jadon Sancho fills an area where they've had problems over on the right side of the attack. Maybe they won't have to deploy two holding midfielders when Varane comes in to give that bit of extra strength defensively. Given the quality of their squad too, should we expect Manchester United to now contend for the Premier League this season? Oh, their, fans will, their fans will point out, John, they finished second in the league last year. They got to a Europa League final. Plenty of good signs. But now do they need to be right up there with Chelsea and Manchester well, they, City? They were okay signs last year. Uh, it's what you'd expect of United. I mean, they, 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 they spent a lot of money now. I think the pressure's on Solskjaer now. Now this is up to the manager now to do it. It really is. I think they've got a good squad of players now. Solskjaer has to do his stuff uh, and be the manager. Make sure that they're they're, they're co- uh, committed to it and they're week in and week out, match in and match out. I think the pressure's on on Solskjaer now. That now I think he has the squad of players. He's bought a lot of players, a lot of good players, as we know. He's got to manage them now. And to, to get to where they want, really want to be, which is winning trophies. What do we expect second season of Bielsa's leads in the Premier League then, John? Are they going to still finish fairly solid, like a little bit naive defensively the, the way they played last week? But are we still expecting them to be somewhere in the mid-table, something similar to last season? Well, it's hard to know because you get the second season syndrome, as they call it, Will. You know, you saw Sheffield United there a couple of years ago. Uh, we, we, we're, we're competing for a European place. The first match, the first season back in the first division in the Premiership, and then go down the second year. I think it's it's a it's a psychological thing with a lot of players, uh, and I experienced experienced a little bit when we were at Leeds. Uh, we got promotion, and I think that you're you're a little bit scared, and it makes you makes you feel well. We don't have it easy in this match. Every match is a difficult match, and we finished runners up in the league. That the second season we finished fourth. You know, so I think that, that that does happen to players. I think there's a lot of lot of uh, situations where, when you get get promoted, uh, right, we, we're really really up against it here, and you do it, and that's what Leeds did last year. Now he hasn't bought any real players in. I think he's made one or two se- se- uh, signings at the most. So, uh, like as an ex Leeds player, I hope we, they don't get the second season syndrome, mm-hmm. but it can happen. Will there's no doubt about it. 
And if they fin- I think what finish in seventh last year was was remarkable for them. And I think if they get there again this year, it'll, it'll be even more remarkable, to be quite honest. Brentford had the perfect return to the English top flight, first time since 1947. Maybe they had the ideal opposition, though, John, an Arsenal team who showed a lot of the frailties that they've had, even going back beyond Arteta. Like, I thought that second goal that they conceded, the long throw, no Arsenal defender protects Leno and gives him a chance to come out and catch the ball. Their new defender in Ben White doesn't deal with the ball bouncing when it eventually goes across the six-yard box and Brentford bundle it into the net. It was a very Arsenal goal to concede. Well, it's been like that for a while, as we know, Will, and uh, I, I think Arteta is under, under pressure now. I, I'm not, I, you know, Aubameyang was, was brilliant uh, in the season where he was, when he was renewing his contract. Um, you know, and it does happen. That does happen as well. You know, the player gets a big contract and uh, doesn't play as, as well as he did when he was looking for the contract. Uh, so I, I, I think he's, he's under a lot of pressure. Uh, I don't think he's got the, the, the players really to, to be where Arsenal feel they should be. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was a bad performance. Again, it was only the start of the season, first match of the season. Uh, but it was a poor for, performance from Arsenal, there's no doubt will. And Brentford was a really good performance. The only thing that disappointed me was the amount of uh, celebration after the match. I know they haven't been in the Premiership for a long, t- long time, but I thought they got carried away with themselves again after the first match of the season. The coach was going around, they were celebrating. First match, what's going to happen? If they're beaten 4-5-0 or five nil in one of the matches early on, they won't be doing any celebrating then. Mm. But it was a good performance by Brentford and a really, really poor performance by Arsenal. A worry I'd have about Arsenal as well, John, is the lack of leaders within that group. Like We remember there are great teams of nearly 15 years ago now mm. where they had toughness with players like Parler and Vieira and Petit and Sol Campbell and players, Tony Adams, who added that you know bit of steel to the team that went along with the likes of Perez and Thierry Henry. I look at that Arsenal team now and you're looking at youngsters who are providing the leadership and the drive within the side. I take out Maitland-Niles and Tierney and maybe Saka who are young players. There's not a whole lot of leadership within that Arsenal team to actually get them through if they go through a bad period. And they've got two difficult games coming up with City and with Chelsea. They lose them. Arteta is in big pressure going into the international window if that happens. I think he's under pressure now. Mm. I mean, Jack is back as captain now. Now, Xhaka surprised me in the in the Euros. He he was absolutely outstanding. One of the matches against France, absolutely brilliant. But he doesn't do that week and we get week out. And he's now back as captain. So um, you know they seem to be going backward, Arsenal, and, and instead of instead of going forward uh, with the team that he has. Um, no, no, no. There's, there's an awful lot expected of Arsenal, one of the big clubs. Uh, will but they're not doing the business at the moment, and they've got to improve and improve very very quickly or else Arteta will be under severe pressure. Yeah, particularly after missing out on Europe last season. Across North London, John, Spurs will have to be delighted with the way their season has started. They still have this saga around Harry Kane, but on the pitch, Son Heung-min gets a goal and they beat the reigning champions Manchester City uh, last weekend to get off to an ideal start under Nuno Espirito Santo. Yeah, plenty of spirit about them. Uh, this is this is the problem now with, with the Harry Kane situation. I mean, Harry has made it known to everybody that he wants to leave the club. Well, it's very hard, to, I mean, and he's their outstanding player. It's very hard to have a good spirit in the team if you've got one of your outstanding, or your most outstanding player wanting to leave. Um, you know, I think from the manager's point of view, the sooner uh, uh, Spurs come to terms with Manchester City, uh, the better it is going to be for him. I mean, there's a lot of talk that he's talking about... Uh, Getting getting Harry Kane back into the team and that that's that's not going to happen. And uh, when you when you get a player like Harry Kane and and you, you build a team spirit in that, it's very hard to build a team spirit if your best player has made it very very well known, very public publicly that he wants to leave the team. Well, Daniel Levy, John, it, as hard a negotiator as he is, he's also practical. And he knows that if the price is met, he will eventually sell. Now, he always extracts the exact price which he requires. And all speculation is somewhere around £130 million would be needed from Manchester City to sign Harry Kane. Mm. They might go late in the window for it to happen. We still have 10 or 11 days before the window closes for any potential deal. But I think if Manchester City come in with that type of money, John, Spurs have to be practical 
and think about the three or four players they could potentially buy and not having an un- unhappy Harry Kane on their books? Yeah, I think I think he has to go. But Levy is, is, is well known as a businessman, a top businessman to get in the best price. But I think if he overdoes it, I think it could well be that City would say, right, thank you very much, we're off. Now, that, it, 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 it's, a, it's a gamble between all of them. I mean, that's a game going on, uh, as you say there, Will, with, with them all. But I think, if, I, think, I think City will go to 130. Now, oh. it depends on Levy, so it is dependent. But the last thing man, uh, Tottenham need is for Harry Kane to stay. Because Harry Kane is not going to perform for, for Spurs if he has to stay the way he has done in previous seasons. I've no doubt about that. He's very annoyed. He's, he's, he's saying that Levy uh, hasn't stuck to his word. Like, this is getting nasty now. And you can't expect a player like Harry Kane to say, OK, let's forget about it and I'll go back and be the Harry Kane that I've been for the last few seasons. I, I don't appreciate, think that's going to happen. I appreciate he's the England captain, John, so the English media are going to give him a soft enough ride anyway. But I just wonder if this had been a foreign player who was deciding to, you know, put it out there in the media that there was a gentleman's agreement that he could leave this season, not turning up on time after his holidays to get ready for the new season, missing their first game of the campaign as a result of that, making it really clear in various interviews that he wanted to leave. If this wasn't the England captain, they'd be getting savage for his behaviour this summer. Well, you know, you have to to look at it both sides. I wouldn't be looking at it that way, to be quite honest, Will. I mean, Harry Kane is a player that they're looking for £160 from. He's a player they got for nothing as a young lad in the club. That's not bad business. And considering what he's done for the club over the past five or six years, where he's been absolutely brilliant. Now, what he's saying is that there was a gentleman's agreement. That's, it, it, it depends who you want to believe there in, the, in that particular way. I mean, what Harry Kane should have done and his legal people should have done when he was signing the original contract was to do what Jack Grealish do with Aston Villa which was to put a figure in that if a team came in with that figure, then he had to go if he, if he wanted to. That hasn't happened. And what he's saying is that uh, uh, no, we, I had a, a verbal agreement, and that's very dodgy at the best of times, a verbal agreement. Uh, yeah. But I think Harry Kane is a very, very honest individual uh, that should have tied the contract up, or his people should have, his legal people should have, and then he wouldn't be in this position. But, um, you know, he has been a top... It's not all, it's all, not all one-sided, Will. Uh, from Levy's point of view, again, uh, £160 million that he's looking for is an awful lot of money for any player, especially for a player that you got as a young boy and didn't cost him anything. If you're Manchester City, John, do you just push through and pay the money at this stage? Because um, they need a striker, like at the weekend. Oh, they need, oh, they need it badly. They it, really it, lack it, the number it, nine it, at the yeah, weekend. It, at the moment, it's, it's too... I mean, in Spurs' case... It, 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 Harry Kane is not going to be the same player for them again, in my opinion. I don't think he can just wipe the, wipe the slate clean there if he doesn't get the move because Spurs are looking for too much money. So that's the gamble that's going on there. Uh, I, I feel that they will come to an arrangement. I think it won't go to 160. It might go to 140. I think if it goes to 140, the deal will be done for, for both sides. For both sides. Manchester City at the weekend lacked a bit of balance aside from not having that number nine uh, since Sergio Aguero has left and trying to fit attacking midfielders into uh, a fluid attacking role we got to see Jack Grealish for the first time but he operated in an area John that wasn't too dissimilar to where Raheem Sterling was and Phil Foden likes to go into that area too might take a bit of time to settle but for me City looked a bit imbalanced in midfield at the weekend well, they, funny, funny enough uh, well, they didn't have a midfield with the way that they played you know, they had Grealish up front, Marez up front, Sterling up front, Gundogan is supposed to be a midfield player, was up front. They were very similar to the situation that they, they were beaten in the Champions League against Chelsea. They had no midfield. I mean, uh, Pep has been a very successful manager, and we assume he's a great coach. But this is, whatever he's doing now is, be, is overdone. I think it's, it's trying to be too clever and too tactical. I mean... The, 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 you stick to the basics in football. You've got to have a midfield, mm. no matter who you're playing against. One, men, men are games are won and lost in the midfield, and they didn't have a midfield. It's, again, like they played at Chelsea in the Champions League, they, they played players all, and they were all forward players, and they all, all did stay up the pitch, as if like we're going to have the ball all the time and we're going to score goals. It doesn't happen that way, and, and I'm surprised 
uh, at uh, Guardiola doing what he did last week. And Spurs deserved to win that match because they were a balanced team. City weren't a balanced team. Terrific players, and it, but as you say, with Grealish uh, on, on the left side with Sterling. I mean, there was two of them there, and they were getting in each other's way, in my opinion. Yeah. So, there's no, so I don't know whether it was being over clever, trying to be too clever. Well, certainly trying to be clever, in my opinion, because it didn't make sense. The team that he picked and the positions they played in, Spurs deserved to win the game. And all it took was three passes for Spurs to get out for the goal. It was a couple of very simple passes uh, to put Sun Young Min into space. And if City had had proper protectors, that might not have been the case. Football here on Off the Ball is with thanks to Paddy Power for information on responsible gambling. You can visit gamblingcare.ie. Uh, Man City favourites going into the season, John, just about ahead of Chelsea with the bookmakers. But Chelsea, again, went about their work really well, I thought, on Saturday considering that they had played extra time and penalties against Villarreal in the Super Cup final uh, a couple of days previously, Chelsea, even waiting for Romelu Lukaku to play, went about their business very professionally on Saturday afternoon. Yeah, they're a threat. They're a big threat. I think Tuchel is very, very good. I think he's done a huge job since he's gone there, Will. And I think they'll get better. As you say, if Lukaku does uh, what he has been doing in recent times, and it's, 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 it's something that Chelsea weren't doing last year, which was scoring the goals in the way that they should have been with the amount of play they have. If he's scoring the goals as we expect him to do, I think Chelsea will take a lot of beating. They are real, real, really are contenders uh, for the Premiership. They had to spend 100 million quid to get Lukaku back to the club for a second time, but he's a better player than he was when he was there as a youngster. Really proved himself last season, went into Milan, basically his 24 goals won them the Serie A title he's proven as well John but in the Premier League given you know, the goals he scored for West Brom Everton Manchester United in previous spells and he could be the final piece of that jigsaw we saw the reliance on Timo Werner and Kai Havertz last year they didn't necessarily score no. the goals but all those attacking players that came in over the last 18 months if Lukaku clicks he might improve all those players around him too oh definitely I mean the players around him have done their stuff they just haven't finished them off uh, well, you now all the other players have done their stuff. The lads that are up front haven't done it. They haven't been scoring when they should have been scoring, which kills kills the game as we know. So I think that's why they paid so much money for Lukaku because if he plays the way he can play, as you you, you just said there, then he will get the goals, and they they'll be real contenders. They're they're good at the back. They're good at midfield, and and Tuchel has done a really big job for them. There's no doubt about that. And if if Lukaku does it. And he's, he's a mature man now. Uh, well, it happens with lads, you know, they go to clubs. Look at De Bruyne, a few players actually, uh, mm. and Chelsea were the, were, were, the, were the victims in that particular way. Uh, they had De Bruyne there. Uh, Mourinho didn't want him. Mo Salah. Mo Salah there. Mm. They, they didn't want him. So Lukaku, he didn't want him either. So I think Lukaku is that type of individual. When he was younger, he wouldn't have had as much confidence in himself as he should have. Now he's a grown man. He's already done it. I think we'll, I, I'm sure, anyway, we'll see a different Lukaku playing for Chelsea than the Lukaku played for them, uh, whatever it is, five or six years ago. Question in from uh, Michael Elish on the text for John and 53106. Is there anything to be gained from Manchester City potentially buying a cheaper striker or waiting uh, along for a younger option next summer like Erling Haaland? Could they wait a season, John, not spend big this summer, keep the £130 million in their pocket and then put all of that towards Erling Haaland next summer as opposed to waiting around for Harry Kane or having to maybe overspend for him this summer? Well, they could do that. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the down point on that is they won't win anything. Mm -hmm. They might say, well, OK, we'll wait a season. But in my opinion, if they don't get a Harry Kane in and, and get the balance of the team right in the way that they didn't last week, uh, they won't win anything. Was it any surprise to you, John, that they went in with the £100 million for um, Grealish, John, as opposed to spending the money on Harry Kane first? Because I would have thought that if you know that there's a clause in the contract that you can sign Grealish at any point for £100 million, you'd be better spending the money if it's available on Harry Kane within the negotiations and then decide if you need Grealish. Like, the need to get Harry Kane is probably greater than Grealish anyway if you've got Phil Foden and Sterling available. Well, I, I think that's a good point, actually. Uh, but, it, 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 like, it, these, are, these are businessmen as well. Uh, well. You know, when they say, well, we're not going to pay £160 million. He's not worth. He's not worth that. And we're losing this particular battle with, with Levy in it. You know? So I, 
I think that I still think they'll get Harry Kane. They might not go to 160, but I think Levy. I think Levy will let him go for less. But I see the point you're making that they could have. But that that's given in to Levy, and they don't like doing that as businessmen, giving them the 160, and then they're not signing uh, uh, Grealish. You know, Grealish doesn't come along, or a player like Grealish doesn't come, come along every day of the week. I I still think they'll they'll get Kane. I think they'll come to some to some arrangement because it's not in Spurs' interest really to keep Kane. He won't have the same player. Yeah. So it's 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 it's, it's what the, it's a it's a game of businessmen between them, uh, and and what they're doing. Uh, but I think I think he'll end up at um, at Manchester City. History would indicate they'll sell and they'll sell late. If we look at Dimitar Berbatov, yeah. if we look at Gareth Bale, yes. players who've left Spurs in these uh, transfer sagas previously. Uh, Barry in Dublin reckons Lukaku is a donkey. He's got terrible first touch. A couple of years in Italy won't change anything. We'll be talking to Nicky Bandini about Lukaku's transformation that he had with his work rate and with the way that he played a very different role uh, with Inter Milan after 9 o'clock and Nicky's opinion is that Lukaku has transformed and grown quite a bit as a player in Italy and I think his form under Antonio Conte is the reason that Chelsea are willing to spend 100 million so we shall see what happens there uh, Liverpool at the weekend John they weren't really troubled against newly promoted Norwich and for Jurgen Klopp the hope just has to be that those defenders stay fit for this season they got the defenders back. I mean, well, they got uh, 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 Van Dijk back, which is which is the main one. Um, I, I think Liverpool, at the moment, are being a bit underrated in the, the, the who's going to win it. I think Liverpool are back again uh, and should be back again to where they were a couple of years ago because they've had a good rest. They've got Van Dijk back. They've got a lot of good players, as we know. And it's a question now if Klopp can just revived them in the way that he had them the season before last. They do have the players that can do it. Now, now it depends on uh, are they, are they, do they have the hunger that they had a couple of seasons or not? Well, that remains to be seen because they, they, they're all a couple of seasons older and they have won a lot. Uh, but they had a bad season, as we know, last, last year. Well, can they get it back? I think they have the players who are capable of doing it. Now, it depends on Klopp to get the best out of them again this, this season. My only concern would be, John, Gini Wijnaldum going to PSG and Liverpool wanted to keep him, but he's been so crucial as legs and as muscle within that midfield. They need Thiago or maybe Naby Keita to step up. Wijnaldum's a big loss. He is, but they didn't try to keep him, though. Mm. You know, they, they, they have this uh, uh, system now, apparently, at Liverpool, that if players get to a certain age... Uh, then they've got to go rather than keeping them. I mean, there, there was talk there about Henderson that they were reluctant to give him a new contract. I think Klopp is, is kicking up about that. Actually, he should have to say on those particular matters. Uh, but, but clubs have different policies, and I've heard it before. Once a player gets to 30, they're not going to give him a long contract. They're not going to extend the contract, and they let him go for nothing. I think it's a big mistake. You don't pick up a, a Wijnaldum every day of the week, mm. and they've let him they've let him go for nothing. Why not give him another two, two year, three year contract, and and keep him at the club? But that's their policy. I don't. I think Klopp is very, very annoyed about it. He doesn't agree with it. Um, so they could pay a price in, in, in any situation if that's the policy uh, for the future. Will. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new.